O eternal and almighty God, from whom all power and wisdom come, we are assembled here before thee to frame such laws as may tend to the welfare and prosperity of our province. Grant, O merciful God, we pray thee, that we may desire only that which is in accordance with thy will, that we may seek it with wisdom and know it with certainty and accomplish it perfectly for the glory and honor of thy name and for the welfare of all our people. Amen. We acknowledge we are gathered on Treaty 1 territory and that Manitoba is located on the treaty territories and ancestral lands of the Anishinaabe, Anish in Inuak, Dakota, Oate, Dene, Sulene, and Nihithoag nations. We acknowledge Manitoba is located on the homeland of the Red River Metis. We acknowledge Northern Manitoba includes lands that were and are the ancestral lands of the Inuit. We respect the spirit and intent of treaties and treaty making and remain committed to working in partnership with First Nations, Inuit and Métis people in the spirit of truth, reconciliation and collaboration. Good afternoon, everybody. Please be seated. Routine proceedings, introduction of bills, committee reports, tabling of reports, ministerial statements, member statements. The Honourable Member for Brandon East. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. World War I began in 1914 and was a brutal and bloody four-year battle that left an indelible mark on the entire world. Early in the war, Vimy Ridge, a region in France, uh, that provided commanding views of the Allied lines was controlled by the Germans. This positioned the Germans to successfully defend three separate Allied attacks, which tra tragically resulted in the loss of over 150,000 soldiers. With both the British and French having failed to capture the ridge, a plan was devised to send in Canadian corps. The Canadians knew if they were to have any hope against the German defenses and artillery, that hope lay in careful planning, persistent practice, and skillful execution. Then, April the 9th, 1917, 15,000 Canadian soldiers facing deplorable conditions and relentless shell fire advanced towards the ridge, claiming victory on April the 12th in an attack now carved in history as the Battle of Vimy Ridge. As we mark the 106th anniversary of this battle, we must remember that victory did not come without considerable consequences and loss, as almost 11,000 Canadians were injured or killed in action while many others carry battle scars with them. Therefore, I rise in the House today to recognize these Canadian heroes for their incredible bravery, their immense sacrifice, and their unwavering resolve to defend our country and protect our democracy. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge our veterans and current members of the military who have joined us in the gallery today, and will be including their names in Hansard. I thank each of them for their dedication and devotion to duty, their pledge to place their service before themselves and their deep desire to uphold the country's rich military history and legacy of service. As freely and fairly elected members of this Legislative Assembly, I ask that we each take a moment to reflect on what they have given to us and that we use this gift of freedom to become leaders who will strive to uphold the ideals of democracy our veterans fought to preserve and so many defended for us. I thank all of them, past and present, for their service and I ask everyone to please join me with a round of applause to show our appreciation and our gratitude. Thank you very much. I'm going to do something a little bit out of sync from normal, but I think this would be the appropriate time to draw your attention to the members in the public gallery, and I would like to indicate who they are. The Canadian Army Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry, the Canadian Army 3rd Canadian Division, 38 Canadian Brigade Group, the Canadian Military Intelligence Association, the Royal Canadian Military Institute of Manitoba, and the United Nations Peacekeepers Association Winnipeg Chapter, and multiple veteran organizations. So we are honored to have you here on behalf of everybody. We welcome you to the Manitoba Legislature. The Honourable Member for Brandon East. 
Madam Speaker, I, I would like to ask, seek leave if we could just observe a moment of silence for those who fought and did not make it. Is there leave to include a moment of silence? Leave has been granted. Please stand. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. We're joined today by the Churchill Bulldogs, a hockey team from Churchill High School in the great constituency of Fort Rouge. Now, the Bulldogs have, after only a couple years in existence, already risen to the heights of Division I in the Manitoba Women's High School Hockey League. Now, one of the most dramatic moments came on March 14th, when the Bulldogs saved themselves from elimination in the D1 championship by winning a tough game by a score of 5-3. to three. Along the way, many players distinguished themselves, including Celine Wozny, who was nominated for Top Defensive Player and MVP, Sidney Stibbard for Rick Rookie of the Year, Lexis Remyard for Top Goalie, and, a hap and I'm happy to report that last night the coaches were named Coaching Staff of the Year. Now, they succeeded with the odds stacked against them. This team played most of the season with a short bench, often only having 11 skaters going up against teams with much larger rosters. That's good cardio. <laughs> they succeeded, and uh, even though they ended up finishing in second in that championship series, it's amazing to see the skills and the teamwork that they've put together. Perhaps one of the biggest bright spots for the Bulldogs is that many of the players are in grades 9 and 10. So not only did they compete against grade 11 and 12s on the other teams, many of the core group is going to be able to return next year to run it back. Now, since these players have already seen the top of the mountain in their first couple of years of high school, I think we can all expect them to be a force to be reckoned with for many years to come. High school hockey is about more than athletic excellence. It's also about giving young people in Manitoba the chance to experience ups and downs in a respectful environment so they can be ready for the thrills and challenges life will throw their way. It's also about cultivating a love for the game so young people can embrace sport for life. So I want to thank the Churchill Bulldogs hockey team for making us so proud and to wish them all the best in wherever their athletic journeys take them next, whether it's playing at post-secondary, coaching, or maybe even next year's Division I Finals. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Yeah, I just want to uh, mention that I've got the uh, roster of the Churchill Bulldogs as well as the coaches and management that I'm including in the permanent record of the Manitoba Legislative Assembly. The Honourable Minister of Health. Madam Speaker, I rise today to recognize the International Day of Pink, April 12, 2023. The International Day of Pink is a worldwide anti-bullying and anti-homophobia event observed annually on the second Wednesday in April. At the beginning of the school year, the Ecole Van Bellingham Parent Council decided to support a student design shirt for Pink Shirt Day and International Day of Pink. Students in grades four to eight were eligible to submit a design based on several criteria, including that the design must represent community and kindness. The school's Gay Straight Alliance group was asked to choose the design and to decide where the proceeds from the sale of the t-shirts would be donated. From the over 50 submissions, the group chose the Kind is Key design by Kaylee Stewart Waldy, which I am wearing today. Proceeds are being donated to the Rainbow Resource Centre. Madam Speaker, International Day of Pink seeks to create a more inclusive and diverse world. 
This day encourages people to stand up against bullying and aims to show solidarity with the LGBTQ plus community by encouraging everyone to wear a pink shirt. Sitting in the gallery are Kaylee Stewart Waldy, her mother, Sherry Stewart, and her grandparents, Ken and Lorraine Stewart. Also in the gallery is Donald Soren, her teacher from Nicole Van Bellingham, and Ashley Smith, Director of Advocacy at Rainbow Resource Center. Please join me in congratulating Kaylee for her creativity and t-shirt design, but more importantly, to thank her entire family, teacher, and school community, as well as the Rainbow Resource Center for showing their support and solidarity against bullying and discrimination in all of its forms. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Flin Flon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Today I stand to recognize some outstanding students from Frontier Collegiate in Cranberry Portage, Manitoba, along with their instructors who have helped them achieve their goals. This week they're in Winnipeg to compete in the Manitoba Skills Competition. With us today in the House are Raymond James, who aspires to be a carpenter, start his own business, and is focused on obtaining his Red Seal certification. Doyle Hutchison, a graduate of Frontier Collegiate who plans to pursue a red seal in automotive technology and possibly earn a red seal in heavy duty mechanics as well. Jolice Hart Brightnose, who is set to graduate this year, her goal is to become a red seal hairdresser and help others feel good about themselves. Dylan Dysart, another graduate who returned to hairstyling program to solidify her knowledge of the craft after the pandemic. Dylan aspires to become a Red Seal hairdresser. Last and certainly not least, Simon Hutchison, who could not join us today. Simon will be competing in a new job search category at the Manitoba Skills Competition over Zoom and is currently enrolled in the Automotive Technology Program. These certification programs are an asset to the youth of Northern communities and these students are proof of that. I would like to also especially recognize the presence of instructors Nola Jacobson, Sheldon Uramchuk, Glennis Valadaris, who have accompanied their students here for the Manitoba Skills Competition. Raymond, Doyle, Jolice, Dylan, and Simon, I celebrate your dedication to your goals and wish you the best of luck in your respective competitions tomorrow. And I ask all my colleagues to join us in welcoming them to the Manitoba Legislature. The Honourable Member for Dawson Trail. Today I stand to recognize the Maris Chapu Arena Fundraising Committee and the Town of St. Anne. The Maris Chapu Arena was one of the finalists for the Craft Hockey Bill 2023. And although they did not make, make it or take home the grand prize, their efforts were truly inspiring. The Town of St. Anne, in a matter of weeks, rallied together with the guidance of the Fundraising Committee, and remarkable things were done. There were signs in every window, both stationary and moving windows, jerseys on every back. There were local makers creating the most gorgeous cookies, memorabilia, stickers, and signs. We had our youngest community members spending all their time creating videos and signs. We also had our most experienced community members dressed up in hockey gear, creating the most memorable videos. They reached out to every possible news outlet and radio station to have some airtime. On the days that voting were for the finalists open, the entire ter town turned orange and black to represent the St. Anne Aces hockey team. <laughs> Local businesses and organizers opened their doors for all to enjoy and were happy to provide things for everyone to come take part in. There were musicians and snacks, crafts and face painting, and games for the kids. There were live broadcasts from radio stations and many shout outs from people across Canada. The community spirit I witnessed and was so thankful to be part of was something truly astounding. The entire town of St. Anne rallied together and truly did everything possible they could do to win. Craft Hockeyville may be over, but the fundraising efforts for the Modus Chapu Arena have not. 
The fundraising committee has not stopped the momentum and are already planning for more events for the St. Anne Arena. I would like to thank the fundraising committee, Sarah Normando, Aaron Musilak, Chantab Peru, Risha Payton, and all the others who helped. Oral questions, the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. People in Manitoba want to see our health care system repaired from years of cuts under this PC government. Manitobans know that Brian Pallister caused a lot of damage and that this Premier was his health minister. And one policy that's continued from Mr. Pallister's time right through to this current Premier's time in office is the lack of a contract for the Manitoba allied health care professionals. Now what that means is that paramedics working in rural Manitoba have not had a contract for five years. It means lab techs, respiratory therapists have not had a contract for five years and consequently their wages have been frozen. This at a time of a health care staff in crisis when we need to do everything we can to retain health care workers at the bedside. The question for the Premier is why has she continued Brian Pallister's policy of freezing wages for allied health professionals? The Honourable First Minister. Madam Speaker, it's difficult to know where to begin with a litany of false accusations once again put on the uh, record in this chamber by the Leader of the Opposition. But I will uh, inform Manitobans with the facts, Madam Speaker. The fact of the matter is we have a $668 million increase to the health care budget alone this wow. year, Madam Speaker. That's a 9.2% increase, Madam Speaker. That's an increase, not a decrease, Madam Speaker up, not down, Madam Speaker. But what I will say, Madam Speaker, is I want to thank all of those allied health care workers for the incredible work that they have been doing uh, day in and day out to help Manitobans who are suffering from illnesses in, Manitobans, uh, in Manitoba, Madam Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition knows that this is a part of a, a negotiation that is uh, taking place right now. It would be inappropriate to interfere in those negotiations. Yeah. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on a supplementary question. This is not an issue that cropped up overnight. It's been five years that this government has frozen the wages of paramedics working in rural Manitoba, lab techs, respiratory therapists, and many other health care professionals that we should be doing everything we can to keep working on the front lines of our health care system here in Manitoba. And yet, for five years, this government has refused to sign a contract with them. For five years, they've kept their wages frozen. After half a decade of this policy, we can only conclude that it is the expressed intent of this government to disrespect these health care workers. So during this health care crisis, when Manitobans want to see investment in health care and not more PC cuts, the question the Premier needs to answer is, why the disrespect? for allied health care professionals. Great question. The Honourable First Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, what would be disrespectful would be to uh, somehow interfere in the collective bargaining right. process in the province exactly. of Manitoba. We have too much respect for those workers, the allied health care workers, for the incredible work that uh, they do, Madam Speaker. And we look forward to, uh, to seeing uh, an outcome uh, sooner rather than later. Of course, we want this to be resolved as well, Madam Speaker, but it would be inappropriate to interfere in the collective bargaining process. Right. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on a final supplementary. U of M? Yep. Teachers, yep. IBEW yep. electricians, yep. Yep. the list goes on and on, yep. nurses included. These are groups whose negotiations have been interfered with by the yep. PCs. Yep. Now all of a sudden they want to cite non-interference as a guiding principle for this anti-labor, anti-worker government. Yep. But here's the thing, Madam Speaker, this government has had five years 
to negotiate a deal with these allied health care professionals. The impact today is that Manitobans living in rural communities are waiting longer for paramedic services because those wages have been frozen. Many communities are seeing health centers close because of frozen wages. How does the Premier explain to the people of Manitoba that she has frozen the wages for our frontline health care heroes for half a decade? Yeah. The Honourable First Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition is so desperate to get re-elected, Madam Speaker. He will say and do anything uh, on the floor of this chamber, Madam Speaker. But, Madam Speaker, what's important for Manitobans is that they hear the facts, Madam Speaker. The fact of the matter is, the Leader of the Opposition and all of those member members opposite know that we have invested more in health care this year. In fact, a 668 million dollars more this year alone, Madam Speaker, oh. when members opposite had the, had the chance Order. to stand up in favour of health care and more money for health care in the province of Manitoba, Madam Speaker, what did they do? They voted against it. We will take no lessons from the members opposite. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on a new question. There is a crisis at Manitoba Public Insurance right now, and it goes right to the top. Yep. It goes to the mismanagement of this PC government, and it's costing you money. Auto pack rates were supposed to go down by 10% this year, but instead, because the PCs are not good with provincial finances yeah. or with management, we are seeing an increase. Everyone's auto pack payments went up on Order. April 1 of this year because of their mismanagement of Project Nova. Again, Manitobans want to see tech modernization, but not like this, not in a way that is going to cost them more money. So will the Premier please tell the House, will Project Nova's increased cost cost Manitobans more on their car insurance next year? The Honourable First Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition seems to want to interfere in the Public Utility Board process, Madam oh, Speaker. He Not believes again. that he knows better than the Public Utilities Board how to deal with the uh, rates at uh, Manitoba Public Insurance and all of our Crown Corporations, Madam Speaker. Order. I would say that that would be inappropriate to interfere in the Public Utilities Board uh, process, Madam Speaker. We respect the process. We will uh, allow that process to move forward. There. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on a supplementary question. Madam Speaker, this Premier's own minister just sent a directive to MPI interfering with their application yeah. at the Public yeah. Utilities Board. They told MPI that they couldn't submit a general rate application this year. So I don't know what you call it, if it's the Premier who's unaware what her minister is doing, or if she's in here trying to Order. lead the people of Manitoba. But the one thing we can all agree on is this. Your car, your, your car insurance payments are going up this year, and it's because of their mismanagement. So we know that car insurance payments are going up this year, but will the Premier tell the House whether her mismanagement of Project Nova will cost you more next year as well? The Honourable First Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And we on this side of the House believe in a strong public utilities board that sets the rates for Manitoba Public Insurance and other Crown Corporations, Madam Speaker. We respect that process. In fact, we respect it so much, Madam Speaker, that we put $2 million towards the public utilities board to strengthen that independent process, uh, Madam Speaker. And what did the Leader of the Opposition do? And every single member across the way, they voted against him. Once again, Madam Speaker. Speaker, we will take no lessons from the members opposite. Shame. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on a final supplementary. 
Madam Speaker, the PC's mismanagement is costing Manitobans more money this year. There were fewer people driving during the pandemic. As a result, MPI rates should have gone down this year. But because there was mismanagement over Project Nova, Order. because the PCs failed to oversee what was happening right under going up when they should have been. Order. Now, we believe that the people of Manitoba deserve a straight answer on this question. The Premier is clearly dodging this question, so I will ask it for a third time, and let's see if she dodges it a third time as well. Our auto pack payments, are the car insurance payments of people in Manitoba going to go up next year the same way that they've gone up this year? The Honourable First Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition continues to jo dodge the facts, Madam right. Speaker. Don't let the facts get in the way of telling the truth, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the Public Utilities Board, we invested more than $2 million to strengthen the Public Utilities Board. We believe in that independent process. Also, Madam Speaker, there were two sets of rebate checks that were given to Manitobans, uh, to Manitoba auto drivers, Madam Speaker, in the way of those rebate checks, Madam Speaker. Well, no one's as perfect as the person from St. John's, Madam Speaker. But, uh, See if she cashed her check. Did you cash your check? Order. Did you cash your check? Order. The Leader of the Opposition should know that uh, the Public Utilities Board, we uh, have been strengthening the Public Utilities Board. Each and every member opposite voted against that. They don't want a strong Public Utilities Board. We do, Madam Speaker. Hey. Order. The Honourable Member for Union Station. Under this PC government, the number of HIV and sexually transmitted bloodborne infections in Manitoba are skyrocketing. We've recently learned that there are already 74 new HIV cases this year. That puts us on track to have 325 new HIV cases in 2023, Madam Speaker, even higher than the 280 new HIV cases in 2022. This is an incredibly alarming trend, and it cannot be allowed to continue. Yet rather than doing literally anything, the PCs would rather ignore the issue altogether. Can the Premier explain why she has failed to take any actions to address the skyrocketing rates of HIV in our province? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Our government takes th this disease very, very seriously, and we are actively working with public health to improve the prevention and treatment of HIV and AIDS. That is why I was pleased, as Health Minister, to add coverage for pre-exposure prophylaxis, which we refer to as PrEP, to the provincial pharmacare formulary. The member for Union Station says that this is doing nothing, Madam Speaker. Many would disagree. Right. The drug helps prevent the contraction of HIV from yeah. both sexual contact and through injection drug use. We also invested $2.3 million over three years to support the development and implementation of an Indigenous-led STBBU testing and contact tracing strategy. Actions, Madam Member Speaker. Honourable Member for Union Station on a supplementary question. Madam Speaker, the increase in new HIV cases in Manitoba is a public health crisis. Yet the PCs have done nothing to address it. People with HIV are not being connected to the treatment that they need. On the other hand, community organizations like Sunshine House's mobile overdose prevention site are stepping up and showing what can be done. They've tested 200 people in just 12 weeks, connecting people to HIV treatment, a rapid pathway to treatment faster than the WRHA. But now the PCs are trying to stop their life-saving efforts with Bill 33. Will the Premier do the right thing and commit to stop trying to hamper the life-saving efforts of organizations like Sunshine House? Very good. The Honourable Minister for Mental Health and Community Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And Bill 33 
is putting the safety of Manitobans and the community members first. Safety for individuals who are seeking addiction support services, ensuring that there are medical staff available to help them if something goes wrong, and connecting them to pathways within the community to ensure their recovery. The Honourable Member for Union Station on the final supplementary. In just a matter of years, under this PC government, under this Premier, we have been set back decades from where we should be in terms of HIV in Manitoba. We know the PC government's approach is not working, it is failing, it is making things worse, and rather than help, the PCs are using Bill 33 to try and shut down community organizations that are doing vital work across our province. That just does not make any sense, Madam Speaker. Preventing and treating HIV infections saves money and it saves lives. Will the Premier admit that her approach has failed and commit to taking real action on HIV today? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Real action is what members on this side of the House has done. Unlike what they did for 17 years, which was nothing, Madam Speaker. We are also investing $632,000 over the next two years Order. to ensure we have more nurses and lab assistants to aid in clinical HIV AIDS services. We've extended coverage for HIV post-exposure treatment, enhanced coverage for HIV treatment for those also experiencing financial or administrative burdens, Madam Speaker. We are taking action. We'll continue to work with public health. Again, it's the opposite of what members opposite did for 17 years. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Concordia. Madam Speaker, it's been four years since the bill authorizing institutional safety officers was passed in this House. Institutional safety officers were supposed to increase safety and security at health care facilities and reduce demands on police services. However, currently there are still zero institutional safety officers at our health care facilities. While the PCs continue to twiddle their thumbs, health care workers continue to wait for that increased Security. Can the minister explain why he's once again broken his promise to our health care workers? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Uh, the member seems to be unencumbered by the truth today, Madam Speaker. Institutional safety officers, uh, the program was developed, uh, it was instituted, and there is a class graduating, actually, I think, last week, Madam Speaker. Oh. Order. Um, an encouragement to members to be careful with the language, uh, using such words as unencumbered by the truth. Uh, he's getting very, very close to crossing the line. So a uh, caution to members. The Honourable Member for Concordia on a supplementary question. Well, Madam Speaker, it's nurses who are telling the truth when they say that at Health Sciences Centre they are concerned about their safety. They're saying that they don't feel safe even when they're just walking to, their, to and from their cars. They want the PCs to finally follow through on their four-year-old promise to establish these institutional safety officers and get them into our health care facilities. Institutional safety officers could help increase the facility security and most importantly protect our nurses and make sure everybody reaches their destination safely. It's time for the PCs to listen and start acting for our health care workers. Can the minister explain why he has failed to establish even a single institutional safety officer at our health care facilities? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Uh, the government committed to creating an institutional safety officer program, one that never existed before under the former government. It created that program. It developed training standards uh, with the support of uh, others to ensure those standards were appropriate. A class was graduated last week. I believe that the University of Manitoba uh, has hired a number of them, and I'm sure the healthcare system might be interested in that as well. Yeah. 
The Honourable Member for Concordia on a final supplementary. Well, nurses are interested in it, Madam Speaker, and they're not interested in more of these PC promises with no action. The nurses are sounding the alarm at HSC, saying they don't even feel safe at their jobs. They want the PCs to just finally follow through on this promise to establish these safety officers at the health care facilities that they work at. MNU President Darlene Jackson said, quote, it feels like the province is not taking this seriously. On this side of the House, we believe that everyone should have a safe workplace, especially our health care heroes that we all count on. Can the minister explain why he is not prioritizing safety of our health care workers? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Justice. I'll try to explain to the member again. The Institutional Safety Officer Program was created and individuals are being graduated. We also created the Community Safety Officer Program and now we're expanding that program to ensure that those individuals can have greater powers. We've created integrated uh, task force with the Winnipeg Police Service with the RCMP. We've created all of those things. We're supporting all of those things. I suppose if the NDP were ever to get back into government, they would do what they promised to do and defund all of it, Madam Speaker. <laughs> Order. Down by member for St. John's. Well, Madam Speaker, this past week marks a sad, sad anniversary for Manitoba's health care system. It was six years ago that this PC government under failed uh, Brian Pallister, and all of these PC MLAs, including the Premier, announced that they were closing ERs at Concordia, Seven Oaks, and Victoria. The chaos that the PCs created with their cuts and their closures is well documented. It's led to deadly consequences for Manitobans, Madam Speaker. So does the Premier think that closing these three ERs helped or hurt the health care system? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Madam Speaker. All of this from the previous administration that closed 20 rural yep. emergency oh, departments yeah. Permanent. permanently Permanent. closed them, Madam Speaker. But our government is investing in health care. Budget 2023, historic $8 billion in, in investment. $668 million more to strengthen health care for Manitobans, Madam Speaker. And more money for the Diagnostic and Surgical Recovery Backlog, $130 million, $120 million to the Pharmacare program. What did members opposite do? They voted against it, Madam hey, Speaker. Hey. The Honourable Member for St. John's on a supplementary question. When the Premier was asked in estimates if she thought that these uh, ER closures were a good decision, she said, and I quote, there were some improvements oh. that came from their PC cuts under Brian Pallister. <laughs> wow. Again, these are the cuts that she supported and celebrated, wow. uh, and particularly as the health minister and one of the failed health ministers at the time. Yet we know, Madam Speaker, that doctors, nurses, and other health professionals warned at the very beginning PCs that this plan was, and I quote, doomed to fail. Yep. Will the Premier acknowledge the impact of this ill-conceived decision by the PCs to close these ERs has pushed our public health care system into crisis? The Honourable Minister of Health. Uh, Madam Speaker, the member opposite would do well to remember their record of 20 permanent closures of rural ER departments, right. Madam Speaker. But here are the facts from question period April 28, 2014. Then failed health minister Aaron Selby said, in the Verdon ER there were two doctors that have left to go to another jurisdiction within Manitoba. It means we cannot keep that ER open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We just don't have the staff there right now to do it. 
Another failed NDP health minister, Sharon Blady, question period, June 16, 2015. We recognize that physician recruitment and retention to rural hospitals isn't just an issue here in Manitoba, it's an issue across the country. Member, time has expired. The Honourable Member for St. John's on a final supplementary. Six years ago, Brian Pallister, with the support of this Premier and every single PC MLA, started their plan Client to close no. ERs and undermine our public health care system. And Manitobans are paying the price to this very day, Madam Speaker. Every day, patients and families have horror stories about their lack of access to health care uh, and the supports that they need. And all they get from the Premier and all of her failed health ministers are more excuses and blaming everybody under the sun. Doctors and nurses are yeah. forced to go to the press before they get any type of action from this government. And even that, at best, is really lackluster. When will the Premier admit that the PC so-called plan for health care was an abject failure? And when will she get up in the House and the apologize to Manitoba? Time to make this fight. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Madam Speaker. More on their record. The closures of the 20 rural emergency departments affected over 100 communities. We're still digging out from the dark days of the NDP, Madam Speaker. Here are some examples. In Southern Health, Emerson, Altona was closed. Pembina Manitou Boundary Trails was closed. McGregor, Portage La Prairie was closed. Gladstone, Nepa closed, 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 closed. That is the record of their administration, Madam Speaker. We are still rolling back the dark days of the NDP. The Honourable Member for St. Patel. It's clear, Madam Speaker, the PCs don't respect workers in Manitoba's colleges. They've attacked and disrespected them for years while making cuts year after year. And just last week at Red River College Polytechnic and Assiniboine Community College, their staff were forced to consider striking. And years of disrespect by the PC government caused it. It's clear the PCs have made a bad situation and now they're making it even worse. Can the minister explain clearly today why her government is treating staff at Manitoba's colleges so poorly? The Honourable Minister of Advanced Education and Training. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, and I do want to thank all of the staff who do work at our Manitoba post-secondary institutes, including yeah, yeah. our colleges, for the hard yeah, yeah. work they're doing and for the response to our labour market needs. Madam Speaker, there is a process known as collective bargaining. It is between the employer and the employees. That is respected. It is protected rights for both parties to negotiate in good faith with the students' best interests in mind. And that is exactly what the staff and the employers did. And I commend them for that process. We will not be interfering in that process, unlike what the NDP have always done. Here, 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 here. The Honourable Member for St. Vital on a supplementary question. The reality is, is that thanks to years of interference and disrespect by both Brian Pallister and this Premier, staff at RRC Polytech and ACC have been forced to consider strike action. As staff at these institutions uh, do essential work to train the future workers in our economy. But they have been disrespected and ignored for years by this government, and workers are being forced to consider a strike. So can the minister simply tell the House why she is failing staff at RRC Polytechnic and ACC? The Honourable Minister of Advanced Education and Training. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 
Uh, voting for strike action has been a right of uh, employees for uh, years now, even under the NDP. That is not a process that we're going to interfere with. That is a choice between the employers and the employees yeah. as they negotiate. Come on, Chief. Members Chief. opposite are so eager to get involved in this process. I suggest the member opposite has the option to resign his seat, apply for a job within one of these institutions, and yeah. offer to sit at the negotiation table. Yeah. But debating it on the floor is not the right way to do this. Yeah. Order. 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 The Honourable Member for St. Vitale Thank on a you, final Madam supplement. Speaker. After years of disrespect and interference by this PC government, the staff at RRC Polytech and ACC are considering a strike. Instead of uplifting essential staff who do critical work in Manitoba, the PCs have refused to come to the table. Their wages are not competitive, it makes life more difficult for staff, and they're being forced to seek work elsewhere. We've already seen two strikes at the University of Manitoba that was forced because of the actions of this PC government. Now, will the minister simply take some action, learn from her government's failures, and fund post-secondary adequately, and will she do so today? Right on. Right on. The Honourable Minister of Advanced Education and Training. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I know that the members opposite, including the member who asked the question, don't like to listen. And they certainly don't like to hear that we actually have a very good relationship with our post-secondary yep. institutes and the leadership. And I, I would encourage the member opposite to really reread some of these uh, protected rights within employers and employees, and maybe learn a little bit about the negotiation yep. process. We encourage both parties to continue the negotiations, keeping the students' best interests right. in mind. Yep. I encourage the member opposite to also advocate for the students' best interest. There Thank you. There you The Honourable Member for St. Boniface. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The residents of Wasagamack First Nation have been promised an airport for 50 years, and this month is the 25th anniversary of a tragic helicopter crash that took the lives of the pilot, Jacques Nolette, and two elders, Flora Harper and Bernadette Harper. Now, Wasagamack has 2,500 residents. It's the only community in the province with over 700 residents not to have an airport, and the costs to the community are colossal. Millions of dollars a year for helicopters just to get to another airport nearby to fly to safety. One member of the community told me this morning he's been in many meetings where this airport was promised and he'd like to see it before he dies. He deserves that and so does his community. They're in the gallery today with Chief Harper. Will the government help build and fund the Wasagamack Airport? And if not, why not? The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I just want to welcome uh, Chief Harper here. I know we've had a number of conversations, Madam Speaker, about with some uh, airport opportunities. And uh, Madam Speaker, I'm not quite sure if the member from St. Boniface knew that we made some major announcements and about $80 million just in airports alone in the north, Madam Speaker. Yep. We were also looking at 400, uh, almost at $500 million for the for infrastructure in the north and we'll continue having uh, conversations with the with this Wisakamak Wisak uh, First Nation to make sure that we look at opportunities in the north madam yeah. speaker yeah. the honorable member for St Boniface on a supplementary question thank you madam speaker manitoba governments will let hydro build dams and companies build mines on first nations but they don't have any problems and they don't have any problems taking resources and money out of first nations but they won't give back first nations are all manitobans too and this provincial government gets plenty of federal funding for every person on reserve that they don't pass along it's long past due time we did i heard from residents this morning that the evacuation of asagamak during a 2017 forest fire was total chaos the benefits of this airport are crystal clear. Better medical care will save lives while reducing millions in extra transportation, lower food costs, costs for everything, even access to critical minerals. It's shovel ready because they've been waiting to build it for 50 years. Why isn't this a top priority for this government? 
The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Well, Madam Speaker, this is a great opportunity for the member from St. Boniface to come to the table to ask his Prime Minister, uh -huh. the Liberals in the, in the government right now, to come to the table, Madam Speaker. Yes. I actually met with Patty Heidi. I had a list of many lists. Cindy Woodhouse was actually at the table, Madam Speaker, wow. about right. with Mac First Nations. So I tell the member right there to go talk to his Prime Minister. Yeah. Yeah. Honourable Member for Tyndall Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Owner and operators of small day cab trucks and semi trucks play a critical role in our economy. A number of my constituents came to see me at McDonald's and expressed concern and frustration as the transportation operations divisions have been causing serious and ongoing problems, which is ultimately forcing some truck drivers to leave the industry. Will the minister responsible agree to meet with representatives who are truck drivers themselves to discuss the issue? The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I want to thank the member for the question. Madam Speaker, um, I, 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 quite often we meet with Manitoba Trucking Association, yep. and all the time we actually have conversations on what we can do better when it comes to our transportation, our highways, Madam Speaker. Our, the, the Trucking Association has come to many of our, our, our basically announcements about Highway 75, all the infrastructure that they're backing us when it comes to over $400 billion of infrastructure spending just in the next five years, Madam Speaker, and we'll continue investing and making sure that the safety for truck drivers to make sure that we recruit more truck drivers for this province and continue doing that economically. Uh, it's, it's important for this province, Madam Speaker. Here, here. here. The Honourable Member for Dauphin. Thank you very, very much, Madam Speaker. Many of the constituents and neighbours in the Parkland region previously had to travel over three hours to Winnipeg to access retinal specialists. These trips created unnecessarily uh, financial burdens and added additional stress for patients and families in need of care. Our government heard from these patients about their concerns and we implemented the first ever retinal specialist project for Dauphin and the Parkland region. Can the minister elaborate on this project and our government's investments to bring retinal specialists to the Dauphin and Parkland region. The Honourable Minister of Health. I thank the member for Dauphin for the question. Madam Speaker, this pilot project will bring retinal specialists to Dauphin once a month to provide care in the community and the surrounding region. On April 3rd, I was pleased to see Dr. Josh Manuso and his team off to Dauphin, where they were able to successfully see 40 patients. The project will gradually increase to serve 80 to 100 patients each visit and will treat a wide variety of eye conditions, including age-related macular degeneration, hereditary diseases, diabetic retinopathy, retinal detachment, eye cancers, and patients who have experienced severe eye trauma. Madam Speaker, our government is committed to providing care closer to home and we are proud to be implementing projects such as this. The Honourable Member for Thompson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It has been more than four years since the Norplex pool in Thompson was permanently shut down. Recent cost estimates for a new pool in Flin Flon come back with construction inflation that have increased by more than 89% which doesn't bode well for the project in Thompson. Will this government step up to the plate with an increased share in funding so we can see this project get built for northern Manitobans? The Honourable Minister of Consumer Protection and Government Services. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm proud to be part of a government that has made significant investments in infrastructure in this project, hundreds of millions of dollars in this year's budget alone, not to mention the hundreds of millions that have already been delivered, and over a billion forecasted over the coming years to be done. Each and every year, we are going to be making significant investments in infrastructure. Now, I, I, I invite the, the member, if he wants to discuss a particular project uh, with my department, he's more than welcome to do that, and I look forward to ha having a conversation with him.
The Honourable Member for Thompson on a supplementary question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Obviously, that answer didn't have nothing to do with the situation in Thompson and the construction of a new pool. We know that costs have gone up over the years, and when Thompson had put this request forward, it was within reason. Yes. The costs have gone up. Inflation has happened, and this government's commitments haven't even, haven't even come to close to what Thompson needs to see this project be built. Will they step up for Northern Manitobans and, and commit to fully funding the Aquatic Centre in Thompson? The Honourable Minister for Consumer Protection and Government Services. I, I thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, as I mentioned in my first response, I'm, I'm, happy to, uh, I'm happy to sit down with the member and to look in more detail at this particular project. I'm pleased at the significant $4.9 million commitment our province has already made. This adds Order. to an, a long list of significant infrastructure investments. My, my neighbouring my neighboring seat partner here has talked about how his department is making significant investments in the north in infrastructure, and the same thing is happening here in my department. I look forward to sitting down with the member and having a further conversation. Certainly, construction inflation is something that's been impacting our province, Everywhere. but we are. The time for oral questions has expired. Petitions. The Honourable Member for Transcona. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I wish to present the following petition to the Legislative Assembly. To the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba, the background of this petition is as follows. Number one, the Bibliothèque Régionale Jolie, the JRL, has been served notice by the Red River Valley School Division to vacate the premises currently situated in the auditorium of the Coal Heritage School by March of 2024. Order. Number two, the auditorium was originally built in the 1960s by renowned Manitoba architect Etienne Gabaret and has been home to the JRL for 48 years. Number three, a photo of the auditorium capture, or, captioned the regional order. library is published in the 2008 document titled Heritage Buildings in the RM of the Salaberry and St. Pierre Jolie. It is marked as an important modern building that could attain the status of heritage site. Number four, the JRL and Red River Valley School order, order, have please. flourished. Order, I'll just... Uh... There's so much noise in here right now. I'm sure Hansard's having a di difficult time hearing the member that is trying to read a petition. So I'm going to ask members as they're departing to please keep it down. The Honourable Member for Transcona. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Number four, the JRL and the Red River Valley School Division have flourished from a mutually beneficial memorandum of understanding for 54 years. Number five, their shared collection boasts over 50,000 books and has the fourth largest collection of French language literature in rural Manitoba. Number six, students that are bused in from the neighboring municipalities that do not have a public library, such as Neverville, Grunthal, and Cleefield, are provided with free access to the public library and its fourth largest collection of French books in rural Manitoba during the school year. We therefore petition the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba as follows. Number one, to request the Minister of Labour, Consumer Protection and Government Services to consider granting the auditorium to the JRL by March of 2023. Number two, to request the Minister of Education to recognize the value that the JRL provides the student population of Ecole Heritage School, as well as the communities of the village de saint pierre Jolie and the RM of the Salaberry. Number three, to request the Minister of Education and the Minister of Francophone Affairs to recognize that a memorandum of understanding between the Red River Valley School Division and the JRL is mutually, financially and culturally beneficial. Number four, to request the Minister of Sport, Culture and Heritage to recognize the heritage potential of this potential building and its status in the community. And number five, to request the Minister of Sport, Culture and Heritage to prevent any renovations to the auditorium that would destroy and devalue the architectural integrity of the building. This petition, Madam Speaker, is signed by Paul Pelican, Julien Gauthier and Raymond Maynard, as well as many other Manitobans. Thank you. In accordance with our Rule 133, bracket 6, when petitions are read, they are deemed to be received by the House. 
The Honourable Member for Thompson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I wish to present the following petition to the Legislative Assembly. To the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba, the background of this petition is as follows. One, the population of those aged 55 plus has grown to approximately 2,500 in the city of Thompson. Two, a large percentage of those people in this age group require necessary medical foot care and treatment. Three, a large percentage of those who are el elderly and or diabetic are also living on low incomes. Four, the Northern Regional Health Authority, NRHA, previously provided essential medical foot care services to seniors and those living with diabetes until 2019, then subsequently cut that program after the last two nurses filling those positions retired. Five, the number of seniors and those with diabetes has only continued to grow in Thompson and the surrounding area. Six, there are no adequate medical care there, there is no adequate medical care available in the city and the region, whereas the city of Winnipeg has 14 medical foot care centers. Seven, the implications of inadequate or lack of podiatric care can lead to amputations. Number eight, the city of Thompson also serves as a regional health care provider, and the need of foot care extends beyond, just, beyond those just served in the capital city of the province. We petition the Legislative Assembly as follows, to urge the provincial government to provide the services of two nurses to restore essential medical foot care treatment to the City of Thompson, effective April 1, 2022. This petition has been signed by many Manitobans. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, member for the PAW, Cammy Sack. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I wish to present the following petition to the Legislative Assembly. The background to this petition is as follows. Number one, Provincial Road 224 serves Pegwas First Nation, Fisher River Cree Nation, and surrounding communities. The road is in need of sub sub substantial repairs. Number two, the road has been in poor condition for years and has numerous potholes, uneven driving surface, services, and extremely narrow shoulders. Due to recent population growth in the area, there has been increased vehicle and pedestrian use of Provincial Road 224. Number four, without repair, Provincial Road 224 uh, will continue to pose a hazard to the many Manitobans who use it on a regular basis. Number five, concerned Manitobans are requesting that Provincial Road 224 be assessed and repaired urgently to improve safety for its users. We petition the Legislative of Manitoba as follows. To urge, to urge the Minister of Infrastructure to complete an assessment of Provincial Road 224 and implement the appropriate repairs using public funds as quickly as possible. Madam Speaker, this petition has been signed by many, many fine Manitobans. I go, sir. The Honourable Member for Elmwood. Madam Speaker, I wish to present the following petition to the Legislative Assembly. The background of the, this petition is as follows. Number one, over 25,000 vehicles per day cross the Louise Bridge, which has served as a vital link for vehicular traffic between Northeast Winnipeg and the downtown for the last 110 years. Number two, the current structure will undoubtedly be declared unsafe in a few years as it has deteriorated extensively, becoming functionally obsolete, subject to more frequent unplanned repairs, and cannot be widened to accommodate future traffic capacity. Number three, as far back as 2008, the City of Winnipeg has studied where the new replacement bridge should be situated. Number four, after including the bridge replacement in the City's five-year capital plan forecast in 2009, the new bridge became a short-term construction priority in the city's transportation master plan of 2011. Number five, city capital and budget plans identified replacement of the Louise Bridge on a site just east of the bridge and expropriated homes there on the south side of Nairn Avenue in anticipation of a 2015 start. Number six, in 2014, the new city administration did not make use of available federal infrastructure funds. Number seven, the new Louise Bridge Committee began its campaign to demand a new bridge and its surveys confirmed 
The residents wanted a new bridge beside the current bridge, but the old bridge kept open for local traffic. Number eight, the NDP provincial government signaled its firm commitment to partner with the city on replacing the Louise Bridge in its 2015 throne speech. Unfortunately, the provincial infrastructure initiatives such as the new Louise Bridge came to a halt with the election of the Progressive Conservative government in 2016. Number nine, more recently, the city tethered the Louise Bridge replacement issue to its new transportation master plan and Eastern Corridor project. Its recommendations have now identified the location of the new Louise Bridge to be placed just east of the current bridge, not to the west of the current bridge, not to the east as originally proposed. Number 10, the city expropriated, expropriation process has begun. The 6.35 million street upgrade of Naren Avenue from Watt Street to the 111 year old bridge is complete. And number 11, the new premier has a duty to direct the provincial government to provide financial assistance to the city so it could complete this long overdue vital link to Northeast Winnipeg and Transcona. We petitioned the Legislative Assembly as of Manitoba as follows. Number one, to urge the new Premier to financially assist the City of Winnipeg on building this three-lane bridge in each direction to maintain this vital link between Northeast Winnipeg, Transcona and downtown. Number two, to urge the provincial government to recommend that the City of Winnipeg keep the old bridge fully open to traffic while the new bridge is under construction. Number three, to urge the provincial government to consider the feasibility of keeping it open for active transportation in the future. This petition is signed by many, many Manitobans. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Uh, Madam Speaker, I wish to present the following petition to the Legislative Assembly. The background to this petition is as follows. Currently, people with specific or non-specific disabilities or a combination of disabilities, such as ADHD, autism, dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, auditory or language processing disorders, and or non-verbal learning disabilities, will be denied access to services under the province of Manitoba's Community Living and Disability Services, CLDS, if their IQ is above 80. People with these or other borderline cognitive functioning issues also have extremely low adaptive skills and are not able to live independently without supports. Recently, it's become widely recognized that access to CLDS should not be based solely on IQ, which is only a measure of a person's ability to answer questions verbally or in writing in relation to mathematics, science, or material which is read. Very often, persons with specific or non-specific disabilities, or a combination of those disabilities, have specific needs related to their executive function for support when they're adults or are transitioning to adulthood, which are not necessarily connected to their IQ. Executive function is the learned ability to do the normal activities of life, including being organized, being able to plan, and to carry out plans that adapt to changing conditions. Those who have major defects in executive function have a learning disability requiring assistance under CLDS to be able to make a contribution to society and be self-sustaining. Provision of CLDS services to individuals with specific or non-specific disabilities or a combination of these disabilities or executive function disability would free them from being dependent on employment and income assistance and have the potential to make an important change in the person's life. Newfoundland and Labrador have now recognized that access to services should be based on the nature of the disability and the person's needs rather than on IQ. We petition the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba as follows to urge the provincial government to change the requirements for accessing community living and disability services so that said requirements are based on the needs of individuals with specific or non-specific disabilities including executive function or combination of disabilities, rather than solely on the basis of their IQ. Signed by Calda Atiyat, Nate King, Diana Redman, and many, many others. Grievances? Orders of the day, government business. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Could you please call for second reading debates this afternoon? Uh, bills number 27, 18, and 25.
It has been announced that the House will consider second readings of Bills 27, 18, and 25 this afternoon. I will start by calling second reading of Bill 27, the Intimate Image Protection Amendment Act. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you again, Madam Speaker. I move uh, seconded by the Minister of Families that Bill Number 27, the Intimate Image Protection Amendment Act, be now read a second time and referred to a committee of this House. It has been moved by the Honourable Minister of Justice, seconded by the Honourable Minister of Families at Bill Number 27, the Intimate Image Protection Amendment Act, be now read a second time and be referred to a committee of this House. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you again, Madam Speaker. This bill will establish a reverse onus on the burden of proof of consent in civil court, so distinguishing it from criminal court, proceedings regarding non-consensual distribution of intimate images. The Intimate Image Protection Act came into force on January 15th of 2016. Uh, so I acknowledge that there are uh, other governments uh, that have been involved in this, and so I think it's a common concern of all members of the House. Uh, however, the changes here would now require um, there to be um, an individual who is bringing the civil case would no longer have to uh, bear the burden of proof that they um, that they didn't provide permission for the intimate image to be distributed. Uh, it would be the requirement of the individual who distributed the intimate image to show that they uh, had the permission to distribute the image. So that is the reverse onus. The Act uh, currently requires the government to make supports available to assist people who have had or believe that they're about to have an intimate image distributed without their consent. That's the amendments. In addition to establishing a new requirement for government to assist people who have had an intimate image distributed without their consent. The statute uh, created the tort of non-consensual distribution of an intimate image. This provision allows a person whose intimate image is distributed without consent to sue the person who distributed the image. Currently, as I already indicated, the plaintiff, who is the person whose image is distributed, is required to prove that the distributor did not have consent to uh, distribute the image. This bill, as noted, reverses that onus so that the person who distributed the image must now prove that they had consent of um, the individual whose picture or whose image was distributed. This amendment to the legislation will increase access to civil remedies for plaintiffs whose intimate images have been shared without their consent. It will also bring Manitoba uh, into alignment with other jurisdictions who have created a reverse onus for torts or civil proceedings like this. The uh, Under Manitoba's uh, Privacy Act, in a lawsuit involving a tort of violation of privacy, the defendant carries the burden of proof to show that the person consented where they raised it as a defense. Additionally, legislation that addresses the non-consensual distribution of intimate images in Saskatchewan, New Brunswick, PEI, and Newfoundland and Labrador feature a reverse onus condition. So as indicated, there are other provinces that have already uh, gone down this road. The bill may strengthen social deterrence to uh, participate in such an offence, placing the onus on defendants to show consent in the distribution was recommended by the Uniform Law Reform Commission in a January 2021 report. In addition to supporting priorities identified in the framework to address gender-based violence, the amendment would support access to justice, a key priority of the government and this department within the criminal justice system modernization strategy and is a principle of a democratic society. The Canadian Centre of Child Protection, sometimes referred to as C3P, which is the agency designated under the Intimate Image Protection Act to provide support to victims of non-consensual distribution of intimate images, supports this amendment. Uh, just as a closing comment, because I know there will be uh, questions as part of the question and answer period at uh, second reading, I want to uh, thank uh, the Canadian Centre for Child Protection for the work that they do, not just in this particular area of the law, but in a number of uh, different aspects and areas. And I know in speaking with them over the last few years, they've seen uh, more predatory behaviour online. Um, partially, I think, because of uh, the fact that many people were uh, not able to, um, uh, to often leave 
uh, their, their homes or their computers uh, for much of the world over a two-year period, and that created more individuals online and created more opportunity for individuals to be victimized online. So they've seen a significant increase, along with other organizations like uh, the Joy Smith Foundation, who uh, works to eradicate human trafficking, both uh, in Manitoba and around the world, have indicated that they've seen an increase in the predatory behavior of those who would perpetrate uh, human trafficking uh, in our province and beyond. And so we know that the challenge continues to grow. We know that there's more work to do. We've announced additional resources when it comes to things like human trafficking and uh, predatory behavior on children, including working with the TOBA Centre to integrate officers into the TOBA Centre and ensure that there's a province-wide response and standard for helping children uh, who've been victimized, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, but this particular um, change might seem like a small change to some, but the reversing of the onus is important because individuals who have their intimate image distributed without their permission uh, often uh, face uh, uh, a lifetime of consequences. Trying to ensure that that image is, is taken down off the internet uh, is a very, very difficult task and uh, can be very, very challenging. So this is not something that will put an end, sadly, to um, this particular issue. Uh, but it certainly sends a signal, and it will help uh, victims so they don't feel re-victimized when they're having to uh, reach a standard of, of proof that should rightly be borne upon the individual who is distributing uh, the intimate images. So with that, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, again, I don't think it's a partisan issue. I acknowledge that the uh, originating bill uh, came forward under a, uh, under a previous government, so I'm sure that all members of this House will uh, we'll find uh, this worth supporting and give it speedy passage. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. A question period of up to 15 minutes will be held. Questions may be addressed to the minister by any member. In the following sequence, first question by the official opposition critic or designate. Subsequent questions asked by critics or designates from other recognized opposition parties. Subsequent questions asked by each independent member. Remaining questions asked by any opposition members. And no question or answer shall exceed 45 seconds. The floor is open for questions. The Honourable Member for Concordia. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. And uh, I want to thank the minister for bringing this bill forward. Uh, I have to admit, I, I missed part of his introductory comments, and so I just wanted to uh, uh, maybe ask a question he's already answered, and that is who was consulted, uh, who did his department and himself consult when crafting this bill? The Honourable Minister. Uh, I only partly uh, address that I can provide, I'm sure the member, a full list of those who were consulted, but certainly one of the key and groups that was consulted was the Canadian Centre for Child Protection, who was named specifically in the bill with uh, some responsibilities for providing support for those individuals who are victimized by this particular uh, action. So it has the support of C3P, the Child uh, Centre for uh, uh, Protection, uh, and I know that there are many other like-minded agencies who support as well. The Honourable Member for Tyndall Park. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can the minister confirm whether the provisions of this bill will be retroactive and to include cases that are currently ongoing? The Honourable Minister. Um, I can confirm uh, at second reading on that question, but in the normal course of proceedings, uh, bills are not normally retroactive to cases that have already been uh, adjudicated or that have uh, begun prior to uh, legislation changing, uh, but I'll confirm at second reading. The Honourable Member for Concordia. Mr. Uh, tell the House what other measures are being taken to support victims of non-consensual intimate image uh, distribution. The Honourable Minister. Yeah, I think the, the member for the, the question, so as I mentioned, the Canadian Centre for Child Protection itself provides and is uh, required to provide support uh, under this bill. Of course, there's a number of other areas where individuals who um, found themselves to be a victim of this crime can find support, not the least of which would be the Victim Services Branch uh, of Manitoba Justice, um, where we have uh, workers who specifically support individuals uh, through the court and the criminal justice system, counseling referrals, uh, and other uh, information on financial assistance that might be available through the program. 
The Honorable Member for Transcona. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, does the government plan to uh, add some of these pieces to uh, health curriculum pieces in, in our uh, high school health curriculums or thought about doing some of that? Um, it's Obviously, this is very important, and uh, I did do a quick jurisdiction, quick scan on my phone to see if it was there, and I didn't see it. So I don't know if there's any plans between his department and the Department of Ed to communicate on this. The Honourable Minister. I'll uh, try to stay in my lane and not veer too much into the Department of, of Education. I'm sure the Minister and others would be happy for me not to do that. Um, but um, I know that there is often uh, special groups and organizations that will enter schools, uh, Joy Smith Foundation being one, Canadian Centre for Child Protection being another, who will often go into schools and provide educational perspectives. Whether or not uh, this particular change would form part of a curriculum, it's something I can certainly uh, raise with my, my friend and the, uh, the Minister of Education. There's no question that providing information on the harms of this particular action is important. I thank the member for Transcona for raising that idea. The Honourable Member for Concordia. Uh, maybe the Minister can just talk more broadly about um, uh, communication plans uh, in, in order to educate victims of non-consensual intimate image distribution. And uh, how is it that um, uh, le the legal recourse that's uh, now available to them um, might be communicated to them in a broader public sense? The Honourable Minister. Uh, it, it's a good question in that it's, it's sometimes, of course, uh, difficult to reach individuals who maybe have been a victim of this particular action because um, they may not be self-disclosing uh, that that's been uh, happening. It's not maybe like a lot of criminal uh, situations where it's easy to identify the victim uh, and then the, the process sort of flows along from the identification of the victim. Because it requires the individual to come forward and bring forward a civil case, uh, it does uh, require there to be information provided, and it is provided through organizations like C3P uh, and others. But I take the member's point. He's probably suggesting that there might be better ways or more ways uh, to ensure that people know that this recourse is available to them, and I take that point. Are there any further questions? Seeing none, the time for questions has expired or is over. Uh, the floor is open for debate. The Honourable Member for Concordia. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Appreciate the opportunity to put uh, just a few uh, words on the record with regards to Bill 27. I do want to start by uh, commending the Minister for bringing this forward. Uh, I do believe that this is an important change uh, to, uh, to an act that, uh, while well exists in, in uh, in Canada, in Manitoba specifically, uh, is certainly something that um, uh, we can improve on and we can strengthen. And I do believe that uh, this particular amendment uh, helps to strengthen uh, this, uh, this protections for folks. We know that everyone has a right uh, to not have their intimate images distributed without their consent. The effects of non-consensual intimate image distribution can be absolutely devastating and life-altering. And in fact, we know in some extreme cases, it has unfortunately caused some people to take their own lives. Uh, it's not lost on me, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that today is Pink Shirt Day, um, the, or, or Pink Day of Pink, that uh, specifically talks about bullying and, uh, and talks about supports for those in the LGBT Q community as well and uh, we know that these issues impact those folks uh, more acutely than other communities and we know that bullying especially cyber bullying is a reality for kids these days that they need to contend with the sharing of non-consensual intimate images uh, is a big part of that bullying culture and so anytime we can talk about ways to uh, support the victims and to talk about ways to uh, to stamp out bullying uh, is an important uh, step in the right direction and again especially on a day uh, like this uh, we do believe that uh, as I said this bill uh, takes a step in the right direction and builds as the minister rightly uh, rightly uh, indicated on a bill that was brought forward in 2015 under an NDP government and uh, at that time, it was uh, sort of an emerging 
uh, issue, a, a concern that we were hearing from our constituents and we were hearing uh, across this province. Uh, but it was in fact, we were the leaders in Canada in bringing forward that kind of legislation. And uh, we know subsequently that uh, I think every province has some sort of form of, of legislation like this, uh, but this really takes it to the next level and really protects those victims, puts the onus, uh, takes the onus off of the victims and puts it on uh, those who have perpetrated this. And, and it does really uh, impact uh, folks in a real way. Uh, we know that uh, social media, as I said, has uh, amplified and, and it's a big part of our lives in every, every way, has amplified this problem and has uh, really brought it to, uh, to the forefront for many young people and, and people in general, really. Uh, in 2018, in fact, the Canadian Centre for Child Protection reported more than 1,300 Manitobans had access their online resources for, uh, for help in the last year. The Canadian uh, Centre for Child Protection is Winnipeg-based, national charity designated by the Manitoba government to help people of all ages who are affected by non-consensual distribution of intimate images. And we know that they do incredible work to offer that help with the removal and the destruction of intimate images from social media and other locations, in addition to providing information on the civil and criminal op uh, op options and opportunities available to people uh, who have been victimized. Uh, by non-consensual intimate image sharing. Uh, this is a, a great resource uh, for anyone who is a victim of, uh, of this, uh, this crime and I encourage uh, anyone who needs that help to reach out to, uh, to that organization to get that help and to get that support that they need. I believe that uh, this is a bill that we can, uh, we can move through the House fairly quickly. I do expect that there may be some public input at uh, committee. I look forward to hearing from folks again, understanding the impacts on those frontline organizations uh, who uh, will be tasked with, uh, with con continuing to support people. Uh, you know, uh, we want to make sure that the Canadian Centre for Child Protection is getting the, the right kind of support and funding so that they can do the work that they do. So I do expect that there uh, may be folks who want to, to bring that experience to, uh, to committee. I invite them to do that. I think that'll be a big part of uh, the process. And ultimately, as I said, we want to see this bill move forward. We want to see this passed by the legislature unanimously and we want to uh, continue to protect victims in every way that we can as legislators and we're committed uh, to doing that. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Honourable Member for Tyndall Park. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I'm glad to be able to rise and speak to Bill 27. And I want to thank the Minister for bringing this important piece of legislation forward. The issues of intimate images being shared and cyberbullying has continued to grow all throughout the world, and it causes many to think about just the pros and cons that come with technology and social media and the real importance of that awareness and education on how these platforms and uses of technology could best be used and should be used, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I know that every February, as many MLAs do, we go into the schools and we have the opportunity to read with students. And I know every single year it is becoming more and more apparent of how young some of these students are who have cell phones, for example, who have social media accounts, and who, I would argue, back when I was in grade two, we didn't have cell phones, but now a lot of the grade twos, for example, they do have cell phones, and they're talking about the images that are being shared online. And some of the things that are being expressed, and these are in my case for I Love to Read Month, but within the teachers, and or by the teachers, and within classrooms, are the content that is actually being spread through social media. And again, this is in grade two, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And so we see it trickling further and further down and younger and younger children um, having access to it. And again, that's why it's so important that we're having these conversations and really spreading that awareness and again, education. And I think we all have a responsibility to do that, whether as politicians, uh, those who have children, it's very important conversations that we are to be having with the younger generations. I actually reflect to back about 10, 15 years ago, I had the opportunity to be working for the Senate of Canada. And one of the first committees that I sat on was a committee about cyberbullying. 
And again, it's sort of, it just shows you how this is an ongoing issue, even back then. And I remember parents coming and speaking in the committee rooms, and they would elaborate on these stories that often in these cases, their children had experienced in school due to cyberbullying. And that was 10, 15 years ago. And it's ongoing. And we know, in fact, it's actually getting worse. And I think, too, like this, this is really telling. This is how we know that issues such as cyberbullying and the distribution of intimate images, it's not just a provincial issue. It is worldwide. It is a federal issue. It is a provincial issue. I'm going to make the argument it is a municipal issue. And I believe that all three levels of government could be working better together to actually address this issue across the board, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm very glad to see more awareness being brought forward on the issue. I notice more and more of those cyber tip advertisements out and about as I drive throughout Winnipeg. And I know in the last six months, there's been a 100% increase in reports concerning intimate images. And a recent survey of adults between ages 18 to 54 found that one in 10 ex-partners have threatened to expose intimate photos of their exes online. And these threats were actually carried out 60% of the time, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The harm of having an intimate image shared widely can have extreme impacts on an individual's mental health along with other impacts that can follow throughout a person's lifetime. And this can be extremely damaging. Establishing a reverse onus on the defendant to carry the burden of proof to show that they received consent is important, and this ensures that the victim does not have to be re-victimized or in some cases re-traumatized by minimizing their needs to establish the burden of proof that they provided consent. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm very happy that the Minister brought forward this legislation. I'm looking forward to seeing it move further in committee and have people from the public come and speak to it as well. And I'm glad that we're, we have the opportunity to debate it today on International Day of Pink. Thank you. Are there any other speakers? The Honourable Member for St. John's. I'm pleased to put on a couple of uh, quick words in uh, respect to Bill uh, 27, the Intimate Image uh, Protection Amendment Act. Uh, I think that the, uh, the minister responsible has heard that on this side of the House we're going to be supporting uh, this bill and let it pass second reading today. Um, I do want to just take a couple of moments. I think that this is, is or I know that this is, is one issue that every single member in this, in this chamber would be in agreement uh, of and would uh, work together to, to support strengthening legislation to protect uh, victims of uh, non-consensual distribution of intimate images. I, I know that we are all, I would imagine that all of us are, are aware of the, um, the occurrence of this uh, that happens, and I would suggest that everybody in the in the chamber would know that um, some of the most vulnerable in our community, in our province, and certainly in the country across the country, um, face this in respect of children. Children are often uh, targeted, um, and uh, they are groomed, they are preyed upon, and they are targeted by individuals that for their own uh, grotesque uh, sexual uh, gratification, um, you know, uh, have children, uh, con convince children to send them uh, images and then will uh, distribute those images. I think there is no greater uh, grotesque example of, of, um, of, of, of taking taking advantage of children than that. And, um, you know, I remember once having a meeting um, at the Canadian Centre for Child Protection many, many years back, and uh, there was a, um, a, a woman there who had um, her images distributed on uh, the internet. And she shared very courageously and openly uh, what that did to her. And uh, those images were there for many years. Many years, those images of her when she was a child were online. And um, 
you know, of course I knew about it and have been uh, you know, researching and lobbying against that, but certainly when you hear it firsthand, uh, the damage, the emotional, mental, and spiritual damage that that does to an individual, it is quite heart-wrenching. And, um, and I, always, I always remember her. I will always, always remember her for sharing her uh, story with us, for those of us that were in that meeting, and how difficult that was for her to do. And then certainly, I think that, uh, you know, we know there are some uh, pretty uh, well-known um, cases of uh, young girls targeted again, targeted and preyed upon by individuals, sick individuals, who ended up taking their, their own lives. And that is devastating. I often think about the parents of those young girls. Still to this day, I think about the parents of those young girls and you know what um, you know the journey that they found themselves in because of and again I, I have no qualms about using this language but because of these sick individuals uh, and I you know I, I think about those families knowing um, you know as a mother myself that they weren't uh, aware or able to protect their their little ones and you know all of us and as parents in this chamber uh, I would imagine or I would submit that that is our, our number one, uh, you know, priority to protect our children. And so, you know, with those few, few words on the record, I, I do just want to say that, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad that the minister brought this forward and, and you know, has now put the onus uh, on those that perpetrate. Uh, in respect of uh, ensuring that there was uh, consent to do so. I think that that's uh, a good uh, uh, amendment to strengthen this legislation. And, um, you know, my hope is that um, we can continue uh, in this Legislative Assembly to work towards uh, strengthening legislation in all of its forms uh, uh, to, to ensure that we um, we protect the most vulnerable and that we stamp out really this uh, grotesque um, thing that we see that grows exponentially uh, as the days and months and years go, go uh, forward. So with those uh, short words on the record, uh, we will be supporting uh, second reading of uh, Bill 27. Miigwech. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, no problem. The Honourable Member for Transcon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. As, as my colleagues have pre previously, previously mentioned, we will be supporting this bill. It's an important amendment, uh, one that uh, certainly uh, is in keeping with the times. Uh, we're seeing a, a, ver a very much uh, technology that is. Uh, getting more and more sophisticated, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and because of that, uh, it is often used by, by, by those that are the youngest in our society. So it's not lost on many of us here in this chamber today that today is the day of pink, uh, a day against uh, bullying. And essentially what this is is a protection for kids, for families, for communities, and it's an important one. I want to stress the importance of the roles that schools can play in this, not just public schools, but all schools. And it's an important piece that I think can be explored further, especially now with the advent of very sophisticated pieces of technology like ChatGPT that is able to now provide and create term papers that, uh, that are difficult to discern and very much uh, something that is, um, you know, concerning but has to be worked with because that's the reality of our day-to-day -day lives now. How do we deal with technology that is sometimes really outpacing our ability to learn its, uh, its, <laughs> its, its capabilities? And so the best place for that, and I just uh, hopefully will be nimble in the future that we use schools to uh, provide that education, to provide that foundation. And with those few words, um, I'll end my comments. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Is the House ready for the question? Okay. The question before the House is second reading of Bill number 
six, uh, sorry, 27, the Intimate Image Protection Amendment Act. Is, the, is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Agreed, agreed and so ordered. I declare the motion carried. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that Bill Number 18, the Legislative Security Amendment Act, be now read a second time and referred to a committee of this House. It has been uh, announced by the Honourable Government House Leader. It's been moved, thank you, by the Honourable uh, Minister of Justice, seconded by the Honourable Minister of Finance, that Bill Number 18, the Legislative Security Amendment Act, be now read a second time and be referred to a committee of this House. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. These are always difficult issues when one speaks about uh, security on the legislative grounds because there's lots of competing interests, I know. Um, we all start with the, the premise that as elected representatives in a democratic society that we value the right to peaceful protest. Um, and this as a government building the Manitoba legislature is often the site of protests. They don't always have to do with government in particular or even the provincial government or even a Canadian government. Sometimes individuals will come to these grounds uh, to demonstrate about something that is happening uh, on another uh, uh, continent or a different part of the world that really isn't specific to what happens in this assembly, um, but it's a common place for people to come and express concerns about a variety of different things that are happening either in Manitoba, Canada, North America, or other places of the world. Uh, and that is fair and that's acceptable and, and we should all value the ability for individuals to come to these grounds and to express their concerns and their views, whether we share those views or not, uh, here uh, at the uh, legislative uh, grounds. That is an important part of a democratic society and each of us as elected officials into this house um, are stewards of that and are in essence defenders of that democratic right and that democratic ability. But we also have other conflicting obligations. We have obligations to ensure the safety of those who come to this building for a variety of different reasons. Often when this issue is discussed, and I've um, been in the assembly now almost 20 years, uh, the uh, discussion used to happen at what's called LAMC, the Legislative Assembly Management uh, Commission. And those um, discussions happen in camera. They're not for public discourse, but they're, they are discussions that happen between MLA is often about the operation of the assembly. Uh, they involve the speaker, who of course is uh, responsible for security of uh, the assembly itself, the committee rooms, and has other responsibilities when it comes to security. It requires the um, coordination of Manitoba Justice, who has responsibility for um, those legislative security officers who we all know and appreciate, who do uh, great work here in the building and on the grounds of the uh, assembly and the precinct uh, at large. Um, so the, the focus is often around elected officials and security as it relates to us as elected officials, but we uh, forget that we're not the majority of individuals who are here in this building. Uh, there are staff who are, of course, working in here each and every day, uh, both for elected officials and just as part of the uh, Legislative Assembly writ large or in general. We have many visitors who come to this building because they have meetings in the building um, and they're meeting with elected officials or they're meeting with others. There are sometimes receptions in this building. Uh, we hand out medals in this building. The Order of Manitoba is in this building. We welcome dignitaries from around the world, including royalty in the very place that you're sitting, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, have come to, to this building. Um, we have school tours. I welcome some students from the Steinbeck Regional Secondary School just this morning. Uh, and the member, the leader of the opposition welcomed some students from uh, Churchill High, I believe, uh, this, uh, just before question period. So we, we welcome all sorts of people. And they also come here with an expectation of security, with an expectation that their time here will be safe. So we have that responsibility as well. So we as elected uh, members of the assembly, we balance these responsibilities between ensuring that those who are, are, are regularly here are safe, 
but the, those or those who are visiting are safe, but then also those who want to come and protest and make a statement or, or assemble for some other reason, um, that, that they have the right to do that, but that they're also safe because they also come with an expectation of being able to bring their views and concerns, whatever they are, in a safe way. So all of those things are balanced. Um, the government brought forward the Legislative Assembly uh, Security Act some time ago that set up a structure. This was in coordination and consultation with those entities that I mentioned, the Speaker's Office, uh, Management of Justice, and others, um, in terms of how security would be managed on the, on the precinct. This is a relatively small but important amendment to that larger bill that we've seen now in operation for uh, about a year or almost a year here in uh, Manitoba, maybe a little bit more than a year actually, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, this amendment would include what we commonly refer to as Memorial Park, uh, a portion of Memorial Park uh, across the street. So there are sort of two sections. There's the, I'll call it a rectangular section of Memorial Park, and then just a little bit north of that, there's a triangular section of uh, Memorial Park. This refers to the rectangular portion of Memorial Park. And all it essentially would do, uh, it would still remain a provincial park, and sometimes there's confusion about that. That is a provincial park across uh, the street, and so conservation officers and uh, Manitoba Conservation has responsibility for the maintenance and the upkeep and the security of that park. But often, of course, what's happening in relation to security is tied into what's happening on the assembly grounds, and that, you know, if there is a concern about security across the street at Memorial Park, it's often specifically because of this uh, building and uh, what it represents to, to many individuals. So the amendment to the uh, larger legislative security amendment uh, or the bill would ensure that the individuals who are responsible for security here at the Manitoba Legislature and on the precinct would also have responsibility, shared responsibility, um, across the street at Memorial Park as well. So it really just ensures that there is symmetry, uh, that there's coordination, uh, and that those who are providing security for visitors and for, um, for dignitaries and for school children and for protesters here on the grounds of the legislature also have a right to uh, provide that same security uh, at that portion of Memorial Park that I uh, described. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, alter the, the pith and substance, as we often say, of, uh, of the main part of the act, of the bill, which we've already debated and passed in this legislature in the past. It simply extends that provision across the street to that portion of Memorial Park. Now, some might ask the question, and I'll conclude on this, well, why not then include that other small portion, that triangular portion of the park that's just beyond the, um, the, the rectangular portion of Memorial Park? In consultation with uh, legislative council and, and those who um, advise us on these things, their advice was that you know, looking at past legislative um, or um, court rulings and other sort of matters that inform on this, that, uh, that you can really only extend these powers uh, to the things that are seen and deemed to be necessary and where there's a close connection. And it was felt that that was a little bit further uh, than would meet that particular bar and that particular test. So we took that advice, we accepted that advice, and we're extending the provisions of the Legislative Security Act to only that portion of Memorial Park, as I've already described. I uh, look forward to the questions that members might have on this. A question period of up to 15 minutes will be held. Questions may be addressed to the minister by any member in the following sequence. First question by the official opposition critic or designate. Subsequent questions asked by critics or designates from other recognized opposition parties. Subsequent questions asked by each independent member. Remaining questions asked by any opposition members. And no question or answer shall exceed 45 seconds. The floor is open for questions. The Honourable Member for Concordia. Um, can the uh, Minister talk about uh, the consultation process specifically with the Winnipeg Police Service and um, maybe give us some details about uh, those discussions? Was this something that the police were asking, Winnipeg Police were asking for, uh, and uh, what sorts of input did they have into the bill? The Honourable Minister. Uh, there's often consultation with the Winnipeg Police Service as it relates to security in this particular area, but because the responsibility for security 
uh, largely rests with the legislature or with the manager of uh, uh, justice and those security officials that we employ, or in cases like conservation officers across the street, uh, that's where the primary responsibility lies. Now, there are sometimes situations where we require more support, and that would include the Winnipeg Police Service. And at that point, we ask Winnipeg Police Service to assist members. We'll know some of those situations, and then the WPS comes to assist if it seems to be beyond the capacity that we might hear, uh, might have here at the legislature. Um, but that's the extent of the consultation. The Honourable Member for Concordia. So I think I understand operationally how this would be uh, deployed. What I'm asking about is in development of this bill, uh, was there a consultation with the Winnipeg Police Service before the bill was introduced in the House? Did they have any input in uh, actually uh, you know, uh, designing the bill or rolling it out here? What sorts of input have they had up to this point, not once the bill is passed and once it's uh, in law? The Honourable Minister. Uh, there's ongoing consultation and often uh, after incidents have happened on these grounds that involve the WPS or don't involve the WPS. There's, uh, there's debriefings and different discussions about what, uh, what we can learn from those different uh, areas and instances. Uh, we take responsibility for this bill because we are responsible for the security uh, at the Manitoba Legislative Precinct and now by extension Memorial Park. The Honourable Member for St. Patel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, so I wanted to ask, the Minister has mentioned that uh, it would be the conservation officer, officers first would be in charge of security, then if needed, the Winnipeg Police Service would get involved. I wanted to know who and how does that determination get made uh, if a situation requires to involve the, to, uh, the involvement of the Winnipeg Police Service? The Honourable Minister. Um, I'm sorry if I, if I misdescribed that to the, uh, to the member. Uh, the, the first order of security here at the legislature is the responsibility of those legislative security officers who the member will know well. Um, and, and they are responsible for security uh, foremost. At times, uh, conservation officers have been called in to assist where there are more, indiv uh, more individuals were, were needed. And because Memorial Park, uh, is the responsibility of conservation officers. And then at other times, when there seemed to be uh, more of a heightened a need for assistance, the uh, Winnipeg Police Service uh, has been called in. The Honourable Member for St. Vital. I thank the Minister for the clarity. So then I'll just have to repeat my question in that regard. Uh, when, when and how does that determination get made to involve the Winnipeg Police Service if, a, if an issue arises? How does the alleged security make that determination and who ultimately makes that call? The Honourable Minister. Uh, there would be discussions obviously between uh, Manitoba Justice uh, and those who are involved with uh, legislative security uh, and the Winnipeg Police Service to determine whether or not uh, if a particular situation was uh, deemed to be a security risk here uh, at the Assembly, whether additional support uh, was needed and whether the Winnipeg Police Service could provide that additional support. Uh, it's, it actually doesn't happen that often. It may have had more heightened attention in, uh, in recent years, but thankfully the vast, vast majority of situations that are dealt with here uh, are peaceful. The Honourable Member for St. Vital. Uh, thank you. Uh, so security I think is really important. We want to ensure people who come to work in this building are safe. Uh, MLAs, visitors to this space are safe. Um, but many Manitobans defining what safe spaces are are different. Um, and so some Manitobans, you know, might see a police officer and feel safe. Some Manitobans see a police officer and might not feel safe. And so I submit to the minister, maybe he can define what he means, uh, how uh, legislative security for this new area, Memorial Park, will actually make Manitobans safe who come from a variety of backgrounds. The Honourable Minister. Yeah, I actually take the member's point quite seriously. Um, and actually, we, we've had a few discussions about this uh, in, in a different context. And I think that his points that he made to me privately were, were points that I hadn't uh, uh, you know, always pr properly understood, maybe, or maybe hadn't been made aware of. So I appreciate that. I've taken some of that back. And I think it goes to some of the broader discussion we're having regarding policing and police training and standards. Uh, it's one of the reasons we engaged with Devon Clunas, a former Winnipeg Chief of Police to bring forward training and standards that uh, specifically uh, have consultations with communities who've otherwise felt uh, not well engaged with law enforcement or have felt threatened sometimes by, by law enforcement. So that's part of the engagement we're having on the policing side. 
uh, and that engagement, uh, I think, informs what happens at the legislature as well. The Honourable Member for St. Patel. Thanks. I genuinely appreciate that answer. And just to follow up on that, since the Minister mentioned uh, additional training uh, for Winnipeg Police Service, I wondered if alleged security would also uh, be, uh, would be allowed to take that training so that they have some of that experience uh, that would benefit their roles and able to provide added security uh, for a diverse group of Manitobans who want to enjoy uh, the Manitoba legislative grounds safely. The Honourable Minister. Yeah, it's, it's a good point. And so the work that Devon Kunis is doing is ensuring that there's sort of a base level and consistent training for law enforcement, not just police, but a variety of different sort of law enforcement officials uh, that we have in the province of Manitoba. I think once that training uh, is, or once his, uh, his work is complete and they've developed that, uh, absolutely, I think that our alleged security individuals uh, could uh, be a part of that and, uh, and benefit from that type of uh, training as well. So I take the member's point and the previous points he's made to me uh, privately very seriously. Are there any other questions? Seeing no questions, we will move on to debate. The floor is open for debate. The Honourable Member for Concordia. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I want to uh, begin by thanking all of the uh, ledge security, um, all of our peace officers that serve in this uh, building, uh, all those who uh, come to work every day to make sure that this is a safe place, not just for us as legislators, uh, because I would put that probably second in the list of uh, most important things that need to be done uh, in terms of safety in this building. Number one is to protect the public and to make sure that they feel welcomed and that they feel safe in this building. And, That's right. you know, we often welcome in, uh, you know, uh, students, classes, uh, come on field trips here, Ages. Uh, all kinds of different people, uh, vulnerable people many times who come to this place who want their voices heard and seek that from us as legislators and we want to make them feel welcome in this place. So that is very much uh, the, the role and the duty of our protective services in this building and they do that job very, very well. So I just want to put on the record uh, how appreciative we are of their work and thank them for everything that they do. Um, you know, it, it is a different world, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that uh, elected officials uh, like ourselves find ourselves in now. Uh, you know, the, uh, the level of uh, decorum and uh, respect that may have existed in the past uh, doesn't always apply in the same ways that it used to. And uh, we've seen that play out in a number of different ways uh, in terms of safety and security of members. And again, uh, of the staff and of the, the public that comes into this building. Uh, case in point, uh, not necessarily with regards to this building, uh, but I know that there was an incident at one of our colleagues' offices. Um, well, I guess that would have been last year, uh, where a yeah. member of the public who had a, a concern, was aggravated, was wor you know, worked up, if I can use that language, uh, came into one of our MLA offices. Now, believe it or not, uh, that does happen quite often that somebody is upset or uh, really just, you know, is, is really needs to, uh, to speak to one of us as an MLA. And that's part of our job is to, uh, to make sure that we're listening to folks and that we're, we're respecting their uh, frustrations. But that's not what happened in this case. In fact, what happened was uh, the person came into the office, realized that the member wasn't there and decided to then uh, take out his frustration and anger on, on the staff that was there to make threats and to be uh, uh, threatening in, in terms of violence. Uh, that was just one example, and that was just one example that sort of got some, uh, some news or, or was spread uh, on social media. But I know in talking to other members of the House, they've had similar experiences. This is, uh, this is the way of, as I said, the way of, of the world now for, for many uh, of us. And again, we uh, as legislators, we, uh, part of the job is making sure that we're, we're putting ourselves out there, we're listening to all different kinds of voices, but when the expectation of safety is compromised, that's where it becomes a real issue. And again, more importantly, when it's our staff 
or when it's members of the public who come into this building who are put at risk. That's where things uh, go over, step over a line that I think we need to be very cognizant of. This bill, of course, uh, stems from the fact that uh, wasn't too long ago where this building, uh, the, the grounds of this legislature were essentially cut off to uh, the public, were cut off uh, even to us as legislators, where there was a convoy uh, that came through, uh, obviously affected many places in our country, but happened right here in our province on this lawn in front of our, our legislature. And uh, we, we take very seriously the right of every uh, Manitoban to demonstrate and to gather, to express uh, uh, concerns that they have. That is a respected right that we understand and that we will always protect. But what happened in front of the legislature was much beyond that. Uh, the pandemic restrictions uh, set some people on a path that led them to violence, that led them to, um, uh, uh, led them to, uh, to talk about hate and to talk about uh, and, and to uh, display symbols of hate and ultimately to put people's lives a, a, in danger. Just here in the, uh, uh, on our legislative grounds, uh, a man was accused of hitting four people uh, in the crowd with his SUV, three had minor injuries, didn't need medical attention. The others were treated in hospital and released. They actually had to chase down the driver who uh, left and, and wasn't caught until about 40 minutes later uh, after he had escaped the, the, the precinct here. And uh, he was charged with a number of offenses, including four counts of assault with a weapon, failing to stop at the scene of an accident and dangerous operation of a vehicle causing uh, bodily harm. Uh, likewise, uh, not too long ago, in 2001, we had a truck that was driven up through the safety pylons uh, on the front steps of the legislature and uh, came up those steps and uh, had to be dealt with by Winnipeg police. Police came and swarmed this, uh, this building. I think all of us remember how uh, that played out. And, uh, you know, it was a man who exited the vehicle. He was agitated and needed to be restrained and taken in and restrict and uh, arrested. These are just a couple of the examples of the violence that came to this building. And uh, it really, I think, shook a lot of us. You know, in Manitoba, we see ourselves as reasonable. Again, there's been many times I've come to this place before I was elected and, and since we've seen uh, demonstrations in front of the legislature. We welcome that in, in the sense of uh, participating in the democratic pro process that is kind of part of the part of the the way of this province and the democracy that we cherish but when it turns violent that's where we need to uh, draw the line now uh, I would suggest um, that legislation like this is long overdue uh, in the sense that we need to protect the people in this building as I said the public uh, but I believe that there's probably been a bit of debate and a bit of back and forth within the, the Conservative of the PC caucus here, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and that's probably why we're only seeing this legislation now. And we're not seeing that something that actually enhances security, makes the building more welcoming and supports those who uh, pro provide those security services for us, but in fact simply makes, you know, what some might argue is an administrative change, you know, uh, changing the fact that a Memorial Park is considered a provincial park and the question of jurisdiction comes into play. But we know why this would be something that this PC caucus may not be interested in bringing forward because we know that certain members of that caucus uh, were sympathizers with the uh, convoy yeah. folks. We know for a fact that uh, the MLA for Borderland, uh, for example, yeah. went down to the blockade that was erected at Emerson that uh, restricted international trade and impacted our economy, impacted people's free movement in between here in the United States. He went down there. He said he visited with friends and family. He said, uh, I think he brought them coffee and, and uh, offered them support. And, uh, you know, this isn't just allegations coming from us. This was on his Twitter. This ended up uh, resulting in him getting kicked out of his, uh, his out of his duties in his caucus. Now, I would, I would mention he's back in apparently he's right back in the inner circle but at that time this was something that people said no this isn't right we're not standing with people who uh who uh blockade and use violence uh 
uh, to get across their political points. That's not something we believe in. Likewise, the MLA for Springfield reshot, right, was uh, a sympathizer of uh, these uh, uh, these anti-restriction convoy folks as well. Uh, he was, uh, you know, all about. Uh, not conforming with those uh, health orders that have been put forward to protect us all. He said, no, I'm not going to do it. And in fact, what did that do? It led to him being kicked out of cabinet. And uh, now he's, I think he's the caucus chair of, of the PC caucus, right? He's, he's directing the whole show over there. So he's he's the one that's, uh, you know, maybe saying to the Minister of, of Justice, don't bring this forward or water it down or don't go after my friends in these uh, these convoy folks because uh, because ultimately I agree with them. I, you know, I, I sympathize with those anti-vaxxers and, uh, you know, I, I don't think we should do anything. This was, uh, this was, uh, a serious concern for most Manitobans, but members of the PC caucus said, uh, we stand with those people. Well, that's not what most Manitobans want. And now what we've seen, the result of those uh, sort of this wishy-washy, uh, you know, not willing to actually make, uh, to stand up against those convoy folks, uh, but wanting to make some changes, what they've done is that this PC government has gone the opposite way. They've, they've said, well, now we're gonna just put up barricades and not let anybody into this building make this feel like a, like a police state where, you know, you have to show your face before you even drive onto the property. You have to show your ID. You got to get uh, scanned. You have to be uh, uh, walked through a metal detector. Uh, you know, all things that help protect us, but are done in a way that it keeps the public uh, fearful or uh, or worried about coming into this building. This is the people's building, Mr. Deputy Speaker. This building should be filled with the public at every opportunity that we can possibly get them in here. And we're not seeing that in the same way we did before because of these measures that have been taken. So I think there's a lot that needs to be done to make our building more welcoming while also protecting those people who, who choose to come here and uh, and per, uh, choose to, uh, to participate in the democratic process, as I said. I don't believe that the PCs are the right ones to do this kind of work. And so I see that, you know, this bill, while we'll, we'll support it, uh, only as a half measure, right? It's just a, a, a one step where they could have really brought forward legislation that helps protect us uh, in this building, helps protect the public, and also makes it a welcoming place. So with those few words, I do hope this is something that we, we hear uh, more at committee stage. We once again hear from the public. That's an important part of this process. And, uh, you know, and I think it's it's uh, important. Maybe he'll he'll do it at committee. Maybe he'll do it at third reading. The minister needs to put on the record that he doesn't stand with the anti-vax and the uh, convoy supporting members of his caucus, right. that there is a serious undertaking here to make this place more safe and that he won't uh, support those kind of actions in the future. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Honourable Member for St. Vitale. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I'm pleased to put a few words on the record with respect to Bill 18. And uh, I'll take a few minutes just to outline um, my concerns. I think overall we want to be supportive of uh, this bill uh, to protect Memorial Park as part of the legislative precinct. Um, but I also want to just touch on, uh, to begin, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the fact that we are very grateful for all the people in our province who keep us safe. That's right. We're very grateful to all the people who work day in and day out to provide security and safety for our communities. We want to thank them. We want to know, make sure they know that their work is valued and uh, we recognize uh, the efforts they put in that we all appreciate and may not express as often as we uh, get a chance to. And I want to say that the people who come to this building here specifically in the Manitoba Legislature uh, ought to feel safe. The MLAs uh, around in this chamber who are here today, the people who work and staff in a multitude of faculties in this building deserve to come to work and feel safe every single day. And the people who come here to visit and to, to, to tour and to be a part of our democracy in Manitoba deserve to feel safe in what is Manitoba's building, a building for all of us 
to collectively share. And so legislative security play an important role in that. And it's uh, important to recognize that and important that all of us have an opportunity to share this building and this space and feel safe doing so. I know that there are many threats these days. And I know that uh, politicians often uh, appear to be, uh, you know, the target of many of these threats. I know colleagues on this side of the house, unfortunately, have been uh, the target of some of these threats. I know that ML uh, MLAs and politicians on the other side of the house have been targets of threats as well. And obviously that's something that we never want to see or hear happen. Um, and it's important to recognize that while these threats are happening, uh, there are proactive steps we can take to make sure that we keep uh, people who are working safe in everything that they do. Now we need to address these threats, but address them in a way that is going to be constructive and address them in a proactive way, in a positive way, that not only keeps us or the people who are the target or victim of these threats safe and have them be put at uh, peace of mind, but also that know that we're proactively looking to mitigate these uh, issues in the future so that they're less likely to happen. And in many cases, that means that we need to lower the temperature on, on some of these issues, listen to people a little bit more often, and find ways to bring people together to have conversations so that we can better understand each other's point of view and uh, hopefully mitigate a lot of these issues moving forward. Now, the issue that I brought up to the minister during my question is the one that I do want to speak about for a few minutes, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And that is how the minister defines security and defines safety. Now, with this bill, he is moving uh, the grounds and the portion of area around Memorial Park to uh, legislative precinct, making sure that the legislative security will be in charge of the area instead of the Winnipeg Police Service. And uh, I say that I ask whether what the minister defines as safety and security uh, because it's important to know that Manitobans who come from a variety of backgrounds and cultural histories and experiences uh, might not always share the same definition of safety. There are many people in the province who, if they walk into a park or a building and they see a person, a law enforcement officer, perhaps because of their, uh, you know, their past traumas or experiences with law enforcement, and they might see that person and not feel safe initially. They might feel a bit apprehensive. They might feel a little bit more on guard. They might feel like, you know, that they might be a little bit more uh, targeted by that person than other citizens. And I think that many people, uh, you know, who come from black backgrounds, indigenous backgrounds, or other people of color, they might, some people might feel uh, a little less at ease when they see a person in law enforcement, especially someone who might be carrying, a, you know, a uh, firearm. And so while many other Manitobans might see that person and say, oh yes, this person is going to make sure that I'm safe, that I'm safe in this space, that uh, everything that's going on right now is going to be uh, safe and secure and that I can move about with ease and go about enjoying my experience, other Manitobans might be a little bit apprehensive, a little bit more on guard. And so I asked the minister these questions about how he defines and talks about safety and security because I want to know, is his plan with this to ensure that there are legislative uh, officers surrounding Memorial Park all the time? You know, many Manitobans might not feel that welcome in that space in going to the park if there are officers, perhaps. Some Manitobans might not feel safe in that regard. It's about having a dialogue and having a consultation with Manitobans to understand how the use of Memorial Park and the security of Memorial Park will match. So that Manitobans have access to their space and will feel welcome in that space, but also know that they're safe and secure there. 
We also know that, and we can you know, speak from past experience, where there have been protests and there have been uh, people occupying spaces in and around the legislative grounds, where there have been, uh, unfortunately, images and uh, displays of hate symbols. We've seen uh, over the past couple of years racist symbols on display, xenophobic imagery, uh, anti-Semitic, uh, or perhaps even Confederate flags or Nazi symbols on display as part of uh, occupations that took place along the ledge grounds. And I'm deeply saddened and hurt by those images being on display, but the reality is that that happened. And the legislative uh, security has to respond to that. Not just to respond to those protesters, but to ensure that other Manitobans who are also trying to occupy what is, as I said off the top, the people's building here in Manitoba and the people's ground, that those other people feel safe. And so I ask and I hope the minister takes those concerns seriously. That if there are these imagery, if there is hate speech or racism on display, xenophobia, anti-Semitic imagery, uh, Confederate flags or Nazism, if those things are happening as part of any protest or event, it's important for Manitobans to feel safe, that they know that security are going to handle those, image, uh, those uh, actions and make sure that other Manitobans can still have access, safe and secure access to the legislative grounds and the legislative building. So I want to put those thoughts and ideas in the minister's mind so that he's aware uh, that the issue of dealing with legislative security and security around the legislative grounds has to be taken in consultation, serious consultation, with Manitobans from a diverse background. That we actually have representation uh, on the ideas of what it means to be safe and secure. That we listen to community voices when it comes to conversations around when do we involve the Winnipeg Police Service in events that happen on uh, Memorial Park. And when do we just simply talk to people to de-escalate de conflict? Now, these are really important issues that, at the end of the day, sadly, it's often uh, you know, uh, people, the most marginalized Manitobans, who are impacted uh, by these decisions. And so we want the people who are making the decisions, or the groups who are making these decisions, to truly be representative of community and understand community by listening to them working with them in consultation. And so I'll leave my comments on Bill 18 there, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and simply put, we're looking forward to this bill uh, moving forward. We're looking forward to hearing public consultation on this building, uh, public coming forward and speaking about the alleged grounds and how it can be made safe and sec secure from a community standpoint. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, we're looking forward to the government listening actually listening to those voices and making positive steps forward. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Are there any other speakers? Is the House ready for the question? The question before the House is second reading of Bill Number 18, the Legislative Security Amendment Act. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Agreed and so ordered, I declare the motion carried. As previously announced, we will now move on to Bill 25, the Workers' Compensation Amendment Act, Wildfire Firefighters, the Honourable Minister of Labour and Immigration. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that Bill 25, the Workers' Compensation Amendment Act, Wildfire firefighters be now read a second time and be referred to the committee of the whole. Oh, sorry, committee of this house. Her honor, the lieutenant governor has been advised of this bill, and I table this message. Thank you, um, Minister. Sorry, I didn't hear the seconder. Finance. It has been moved by the Honourable Minister of Labour and Immigration, seconded by the Honourable Minister of Finance, that Bill Number 25, the Workers' Compensation Amendment Act, Wildfire Firefighters, be now read a second time and be referred to a committee of this House. 
Her Honor, the Lieutenant Governor, has been advised of the contents of this resolution, recommends it to the House, and the message has been tabled. The Honorable Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm pleased to rise again to provide comments on Bill uh, 25. This bill will include wildfire firefighters within the presumptive cancer and heart injury provisions of the Workers' Compensation Act. Currently, these provisions only apply to urban firefighters and Office of the Fire Commissioner personnel. Wildfire firefighters are currently not included within the presumptive cancer and heart injury provisions of the Act. Right now, in order for the presumption to apply, a firefighter must have been regularly exposed to the hazards of a fire scene other than a forest fire. The proposed amendments will remove this exception and will add the definition of wildfire firefighter to the presumptive provisions of the Act. In order to ensure the risks associated with the role of wildfire firefighter are equally recognized. We value the efforts of our wildfire firefighters and acknowledge their role uh, has become increasingly critical. The number and size of wildfires are increasing, wildfire seasons are going longer, and wildfire firefighters are often uh, called upon more often to assist other jurisdictions in their firefighting efforts. With these changes, Manitoba continues to serve as a model for other jurisdictions. This legislation aligns us with our counterparts in British Columbia and some other jurisdictions around the world that have moved to include wildfire firefighters within workers' compensation presumptive cancer provisions. Going forward, wildfire firefighters who submit workplace injury and illness claims to the Workers' Compensation Board relating to the cancers and heart injuries prescribed under the Act will benefit from the same streamlined adjudicative process available to other types of firefighters. The bill puts all firefighters on equal footing. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. A question period of up to 15 minutes will be held. Questions may be addressed to the minister by any member in the following sequence. First question by the official opposition, critic or designate. Subsequent questions asked by critics or designates from other recognized opposition parties. Subsequent questions asked by each independent member. Remaining questions asked by any opposition members and no question and no answer shall exceed 45 seconds. The floor is open for questions. There are some questions, that's good, okay. The honorable member, forgive me. For Notre Dame. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'd just like to ask the minister who was consulted when writing this bill. The honorable minister. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can you repeat the question again? I didn't hear, sorry. The Honourable Member for Notre Dame. Uh, who was consulted when writing this bill? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I believe she asked me the question, who was consulted with respect to uh, Bill 25? Uh, so, um, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we consulted with the Manitoba Federation of Labour, the United Firefighters of Winnipeg, and the Manitoba Government uh, and, Gen uh, and General Employees Union, MGU. Um, the MFL had asked the government of Manitoba to consider removing the exclusion for wildfire firefighters and had considered the hazards of wildfires on a similar scale as those presented uh, in urban firefighting. The Honourable Member for Tyndall Park. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister share with the House the number of claims as a result of heart injuries or specific cancers that were made by firefighters last year? The Honourable Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker. What I can say is that the Workers' Compensation Board uh, anticipates uh, minimal implications as a result of these amendments. Uh, claims from wildfire firefighters are already accepted without the presumptive provision. Further, there have been very few claims from wildfire firefighters related to cancers, but we want to ensure uh, fairness and, and inclusivity with regards to, uh, to those who are uh, fighting fires. Uh, this includes wildfire firefighters. Uh, this will allow for more, a more streamlined and less erroneous uh, adjudication process. The Honourable Member from Notre Dame. 
I'd just like to ask this minister um, why the PC government is just recognizing uh, wildland firefighters at this point. Was there a reason that this inclusion or amendment didn't come sooner? The Honorable Minister. Uh, with the number and uh, size of wildfires increasing, uh, wildfire seasons are growing longer, and Manitoba's wildfire firefighters are being called to assist other jurisdictions in their firefighting efforts. We have seen the other, that other jurisdictions have begun to include wildfire firefighters in presumptive cancer legislation. In 2019, British Columbia amended its workers' compensation legislation to allow wildfire firefighters to benefit from its firefighter presumption. The Honourable Member for Kiwatanuk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I wonder if the, mem uh, the Minister can provide us with a list of occupations that are categorized as wildfire firefighters. The Honourable Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I can uh, get back to that member uh, after a second reading. The Honourable Member for Notre Dame. I'd just like to ask um, if there could be more done to reduce the risk of cancer, um, such as increasing funding to municipalities to purchase better protective, personal protective equipment to keep our firefighters safe. The Honourable Minister. Uh, what I can tell the member is that uh, uh, this uh, firefighter presumption, uh, the firefighter presumption simplifies the adjudication of workers' compensation claims made by firefighters who contract certain cancers or sustain heart injuries it makes it easier to establish that work uh, caused their illness or injury. Uh, the presumption was originally developed to address the hazards associated with burning buildings and synthetic materials. Initially, it only applied to full-time urban firefighters with, with part-time urban firefighters and the Office of the Fire Commissioner personnel being included in 2005 and 2011, respectively. But that's why we want to include wildfire firefighters in this amendment. The Honourable Member for Notre Dame. I'm wondering if the minister could uh, let the House know how many units or how many wildland firefighters and staff are currently employed with the Manitoba Wildfire Service. The Honourable Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, what I can tell the member is that uh, this is seasonal employment under the uh, Manitoba Government, uh, um, the Manitoba Government uh, General's Employees Union. Uh, so the number uh, always uh, changes depending on the number of wildfires that we have uh, in the province. Uh, what I could also say on the record is that I want to thank Manitobans uh, who actually go to other jurisdictions and those wildfire firefighters who come to our jurisdiction to help with these wildfires. The Honourable Member for Notre Dame. I'm just wondering if the Minister could maybe speak a little bit about um, the number of crews that we have as part of the initial attack crews and maybe our, our possible numbers for this season coming into um, to find out how many emergency firefighters there are. That's the type two firefighters that would be hired for this season. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, with, respect, with respect to the number of crews, again, it's all dependent on the situation uh, as these wildfires are unpredictable. Uh, but we do, uh, I know the department does prepare and I can give her a more definitive response by getting that information. The Honourable Member for Notre Dame. Thank you, Minister Deputy Speaker. I'm wondering if the Minister could please elaborate a little bit about uh, presumptive coverage as it relates to cardiovascular disease and mortality. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, for the presumption to apply, the worker must have been regularly exposed to the hazards of a fire scene. Uh, than hazards of a forest fire. Uh, they also must have been employed as a firefighter for a spirit, uh, specific period of time. In the case of the heart injury presumption, when a worker is a firefighter or uh, OFC personnel and suffers a heart injury within 24 hours uh, after attendance at an emergency response, the heart injury is presumed to have been caused by work unless the contrary is proven. The Honourable Member for Notre Dame. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm just wondering if our departments, uh, government departments, carry any statistics regarding um, overtime hours, uh, a total number of hours, an average number of years served by our uh, wildfire service members. Um, I just want to have an idea about um, the kind of shift work and hours that are served um, and how how long our seasons are going now compared to the past 
Um, we know that wildland firefighters smoke exposure um, really increases the risk of lung cancer and cardiovascular disease. And um, it's really this, this amount of disease, it directly correlates to the number of overtime hours worked and the length of our seasons. So I'm just wondering Members if our time department has is expired. carrying those statistics. The Honourable Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. What I can tell the member is uh, what it, this, this, uh, this act differs from the existing legislation because it does not include wild firefighters uh, within the scope of the presumptive cancer heart inju injury provisions of the act. The amendment will remove the limitation to better recognize the hazards of wildfires on their health uh, to include wild fire firefighters within the presumption provisions, a definition of wild firefighters is established and condition for a regular exposure to the hazards of a fire scene other than the hazards of a forest fire is amended to remove the limitation for forest fires. The Honourable Member for Kiwatanuk. Uh, yes, I wonder if the Minister could, could confirm or that uh, this also covers emergency firefighters or EFFs that are not necessarily seasonal employees but just call on a per need basis. The Honourable Minister. Uh, in the regular claims process, the Workers' Compensation Board determines whether or not a worker is entitled to compensation based upon the information provided by the worker, the employer, health care professionals and witnesses. Presumptive legislation assumes that a worker's injury or illness was caused by the job without requiring the WCB to establish this. In this case, where a worker uh, is or has been a firefighter or office of the fire commissioner personnel regularly exposed to the hazards of a fire scene, suffers from any of the identified cancers, the disease is presumed to be an occupational disease, the dominant cause of which is employment as a firefighter, unless the contrary, is, again, is proven. The Honourable Member for Kiwatanuk. Uh, yes, I wonder if the Minister can then confirm then that this is also accessible to not only initial attack, but fire rangers, one, two, three, four, and also district fire rangers as well. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Wildfire firefighters will have similar eligibility required to those already established to full and part-time firefighters and office of the fire commissioner personnel. The minimum periods of employment and non-smoking firefighters and OFC personnel regulation sets a minimum period of cumulative employment for each type of cancer that is included in presumptive legislation, as well as minimum periods of non-smoking. Wildfire firefighters generally operate between May to October each year when wildfires frequently occur, which means it may take these workers longer to accumulate the community employment necessary. The Honourable Member for Kiwatanuk. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm wondering if the Minister can confirm then that does this bill then take effect as of the day, or is there also retroactive symptoms that uh, a wildfire fighter may have had for you know, the past number of years, and does that person then eligible for compensation under this act when it takes effect? The Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, minimum eligibility requirements, uh, minimum eligibility periods are established for each type of cancer covered by the Act within the shortest eligibility period begin, uh, being uh, five years of cumulative service. Uh, the amendments will make it easier to demonstrate causation in cases of where wildfire fires are diagnosed with certain cancers or sustain certain heart injuries. The, will, the bill will put all firefighters on equal footing in terms of establishing causations and they sustain one or more of the cancers or heart injuries specified in the presumption. Once brought into force, the bill will ensure wild firefighters benefit from the same presumption as other firefighters. The Honourable Member for Kuwatana. Uh Yes, thank you. Um, that, that still really didn't clarify or answer the question uh, whether or not that takes effect from this day forward, and then the kind of the clock sets on a wild firefighter's eligibility if you want to use that word, to be able to qualify for workers' compensation. What if prior to this bill taking effect, there is somebody who's had the effects prior to this, maybe it'd be a year, two years, or, or more than that. Are they then eligible for workers' compensation under this program? The Honourable Minister. Thank you. Uh, uh, I want to thank the member for the question there, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, based on this category, it's, it's not retroactive. Are there any further questions? Seeing none, we will move on to debate. The floor is open for debate. The Honourable Member for Notre Dame. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, before beginning uh, my comments uh, regarding this bill, I would just like to uh, express my deepest condolences to the family of Tyler Riley Manich of the Paw, Manitoba, 
who on July 11th um, last year was injured in an ATV accident during a training exercise. He was a part of the Manitoba wildfire service community. Um, and again, our deepest condolences go to his mother, Candy, his family, his friends, um, the rest of the Manitoba Wildfire Service community and the PAW Fire Department of which Tyler was a member. Um, you really get a sense of how dangerous uh, wildland firefighting is um, when you hear that um, not only do uh, folks um, doing this type of work um, need this type of presumptive cap coverage for different types of carcinogens and, um, and cardiovascular disease and mortality, but also just even in the simple, or what should be a simpler task of training, even even in training, um, these types of uh, dangers are inherent in this type of work here. So I'd just like to, uh, again, express my condolences to the family of Mr. Manich. The purpose of this bill is to amend the uh, Worker Compensations Act, Workers' Compensation Act to extend its presumptions to wildfire firefighters. And Bill 25 will ensure that wildland firefighters are treated equal to other firefighters in Manitoba under the Workers' Compensation Act. Again, I'd have to say that wildland firefighting is inherently dangerous work. Um, this work is primarily performed in forest and in range environments and steep terrain where surfaces may be extremely uneven, rocky, covered with vegetation, and in smoky conditions. Temperatures vary from above 100 degrees Fahrenheit to below freezing. Risks include smoke inhalation, fire entrapment, insect bites and stings, exposure to excessive machinery noise, and falling and rolling materials. This work is also very physically demanding. Duties can involve rigorous field work requiring above average physical performance, endurance, and superior conditioning. This work requires prolonged standing, walking over uneven ground, and recurring bending, reaching, lifting, and carrying of items weighing over 50 pounds, and shared lifting and carrying of heavier items, thank you, and similar strenuous activities requiring at least average agility and dexterity. I don't know if I would be able to do this work, but I know that my colleague, the MLA for Kiwatanuk, um, did undertake this very challenging and dangerous work in his younger days. Um, locations throughout the province um, where um, the Manitoba Wildfire Service community serves includes Paint Lake, Cross Lake, Norway House, Island Lake, Wakusco, Cold Lake, the Paw, Swan River, Grand Rapids, Hodgson, Gypsumville, Bissett, Pine Falls, Plaquebonne, Rennie, Haddishville, Marchand, Piney, among other um, locations, and a and apparently the seasonal department positions run from April to September. Activities within the designated burning permit area as well as within provincial parks, the coordination of provincial wildfire prevention and mitigation messaging, and they are the lead provincial agency for wildfire suppression operations and value protection efforts in all unorganized territory, crown lands, and provincial parks not covered by local protection agreements. They are deployed to protect provincial assets, including provincial air tankers, um, helicopters, and fixed wing aircraft, and provincial initial attack crews. They provide support to municipalities and other local authorities based on the availability of resources. When, when wildland firefighters and all firefighters suffer from certain types of primary cancers or heart injuries, this firefighter presumption allows them to establish that their cancer or injury is work-related. Currently, this presumption does not apply to wildland firefighters. Bill 25 proposes that illnesses and injuries presumed to be caused by firefighting will be covered by the Workers' Compensation Act and will now include those who battle wildfires. Terms from the Workers' Compensation Act, like full-time firefighter or a part-time firefighter, will be substituted with full-time, part-time, or wildfire firefighter. 
The term wildfire firefighter refers to a worker employed to suppress or extinguish wildfires who is not a full-time firefighter, a part-time firefighter, or a member of OFC personnel. Under the current act, if firefighters or the Office of the Fire Commissioner personnel are diagnosed with one of 19 designated cancers or suffer a heart injury within 24 hours of responding to an emergency, the act presumes this to be a work-related illness or injury. I would like a little bit more clarification as this process goes on regarding other types of um, cardiovascular disease or mortality, um, whether or not that is going to be included um, with the workers' compensation presumpt presumptive coverage. Um, there is more um, research in recent years that have showed that not only are carcinogens um, uh, part of the health-related risks that, that wildland firefighters and other firefight firefighters um, um, have to endure, but also um, cardiovascular disease and mortality. Um, specifically with um, the smoke inhalation, um, with particulate matter, um, that very small, um, really millions of a meter, micrometers, um, but these um, part particulate matter, they enter, um, they can enter our wildland firefighters' lungs and, and have those types of um, negative outcomes in health. Over time, as science has progressed and technology has advanced, we have learned more about the greater risk our firefighters take on each and every day. Wildfire firefighters are not left out of this risk as wildfires have increased at a rate of 3% over the last two decades. In fact, the number of wildfires have been predicted to rise by 50% by 2100 as a result of climate change. Yet, wildfire uh, firefighters are not included in the current Workers' Compensation Act. Wildland firefighters deserve to be compensated commensurate to the risk that they are exposed to for the safety of citizens. They work amidst dangerous gases and fumes and particulate matter that have the potential to cause long-term harm to their health. Again, cancer is the leading cause of fatalities among firefighters in Canada, but I do believe more research um, recently has been done to show that even cardiovascular disease and, and morbidity is related to, um, to, to these health hazards that firefighters in Canada are experiencing. Currently, it's estimated that 50 firefighters out of 100,000 die of cancer each year. That's 50 too many. I know all members in the House would agree to that. Firefighters have up to six times greater exposures to carcinogens than the rest of the populations. Carcinogens such as polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, benzene, diesel engine exhaust, ethyl benzene, solar radiation, formaldehyde, and polychlorinated biphenyls. Wildland firefighters are also exposed to heavy muscle work, extreme temperatures, sympathetic nervous system activation, and are at similar risk as regular firefighters of suffering from heart injury. Therefore, they should receive the same treatment. Um, I just wanted to highlight two um, recent studies um, that are specifically um, concerning uh, wildland firefighters. The first is uh, one that's coming out from the Bio5 Institute and the University of Arizona Cancer Center. The study is entitled Wildland Firefighters, Exposure Assessment, Carcinogenic Effects, and Risk Management. And the second um, study that just specifically deals with wildland firefighters is called Wildland Firefighters Smoke Exposure and Risk of Lung Cancer and Cardiovascular Disease Mortality. And that's by um, authors Joseph W. Um, Dimitrovich and Kathleen M. Navarro. Um, this last study that I, I referenced, um, they were able to um, really get a sense that um, there are increased risks of lung cancer, and it could range from 8% to 43% in cardiovascular disease, and that could range from 16% to 30% mortality. And that range was in direct proportion to the amount of years served and the amount of hours that were worked by these wildland firefighters. So I, again, um, earlier in our questions to the minister, I was trying to ascertain um, 
if our departments are carrying those types of numbers about overtime hours and length of time for the seasonal work because we are seeing that there are direct risks for cardiovascular disease mortality and um, lung cancer and it just really relates to the time and length of work. Um, while advancements have been made to the Workers' Compensation Act throughout the years, many women have also found that the cancers they were being diagnosed with were not recognized and it actually forced them to fight for coverage while they were ill. Um, but we all know that fires, um, that wildland firefighters fight don't know gender, it affects whomever is exposed to the toxic smoke. Again, um, the member for Kiwatanek was referencing also emergency uh, firefighters and we're also hoping that these folks are also included in the presumptive coverage, even though they aren't, um, you know, considered uh, the seasonal full-time employed with Manitoba Wildfire Service. Um, we're hoping to grow this list of presumptive coverage and while protecting women currently in the field, expanding coverage to wildland firefighting could make firefighting a more appealing career to enter into for women because they'll know that um, they do have those kinds of safety uh, concerns covered in case um, they will need to be recognized and compensated. Um, those are all my comments uh, at this point uh, regarding this bill. Um, I am doing a little bit more research regarding uh, the current safety protections and the numbers of crews that we have um, hired, and um, and I'm I'm waiting to hear from from these uh, members of of these unions to see what their concerns are, and I'd be happy to raise uh, what what new. Um, concerns are being raised to the minister and to the house uh, once I get that information at our next opportunity at the third reading. Thank you for um, the time. The Honourable Member for Tyndall Park. Uh, thank you Madam Speaker for the opportunity to rise and just put a few words on record. Uh, this legislation is very much direct and straightforward and I'm glad it's being brought forward. Just in recent history, Manitoba has had some of the worst wildfires. Last year, for example, over 2,000 evacuees fled Matthias Kalem Cree Nation after wildfires forced people from their homes. This fire alone was approximately 23,000 hectares in size, and it's noted that many additional firefighter resources, like water bombers and firefighters themselves, including some from Ontario, were sent to help and work. Madam Speaker, this shows the role that our firefighters play and just how grateful we should be for them as well as for our Red Cross volunteers. We know that wildfire firefighters work with less support than urban firefighters and can often be under-resourced. And while this bill helps fill in gaps that exist for many rural wild fire firefighters and we are very happy to support it i want to encourage the government to take it even a step further by considering more work related issues to assist our first responders for example currently the workers compensation act covers post traumatic stress disorder as a work related occupational disease injuries related to mental health and excessive stress is a huge issue that many firefighters including wildlife firefighters face which is why it should be examined further mental health supports are often difficult to access especially for firefighters in rural areas these can be significant medical expenses that should not have to be a burden for any of our first responders or anyone quite frankly madam speaker I'm tabling an article where the Manitoba Federation of Labour says mental health injuries sustained while working should be covered by workers' compensation. Manitoba Federation of Labour represents about 125,000 members and is calling on this government to make changes so the Workers' Compensation Board of Manitoba includes more mental health coverage. Madam Speaker, these are just a couple of extra ideas that I'm hoping will also be brought into legislation as a way to continually monitor and reassess workplace injuries to protect our frontline workers like firefighters and first responders. But for the sake of Bill 25, the Workers' Compensation Amendment Act, Wildlife Firefighters, we are happy to support it. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Kuwait Nook. Madam Speaker. I uh, wanted to share a, a few comments about the uh, Bill 25, the Workers' Compensation Amendment Act, wildfire firefighters, or wildfire fighters. Uh, just more so from, from some experience as uh, 
my constituency is uh, is largely uh, geographically the largest one in Manitoba, which is covered by a lot of uh, forest and, and dry timber and uninhabited areas. Um, so when I, when I asked the minister earlier uh, about the, the, the coverage in, in, and who would be covered under this piece of legislation, um, it kind of hit near and dear to not only my home community, but my constituency as a whole. Uh, and the question I asked earlier about uh, uh, emergency firefighters or EFFs as they're more commonly known, to see if that coverage applies to them. Uh, because time and time again, they are called on on a regular basis. And we have, over these past number of years, uh, we've been starting to call it unusual amount of fire activity, but it's now becoming the norm. Uh, and I know the government has a, a real issue with recruitment and retention for conservation in that area. So they rely a lot upon emergency firefighters. So I wanted to ensure, and, and hopefully if it's not clarified in this piece of legislation, there, there may be amendments or when it comes to committee and whatever else theory that it may be addressed, uh, but that emergency firefighters and uh, fire rangers uh, two, three, four, district fire rangers two and three are also covered in this. And it doesn't, this, this piece of legislation does not narrow it down and, and really super define the definition of wildfire firefighters to where it doesn't really apply to the people that need it the most, to the people that are on the front lines. Because we talk about the front lines and, and, and wildfire firefighters in Manitoba are absolutely the front lines. But that's also contingent also on emergency firefighters. And I think a lot of my, my, my colleagues in particular, the North, the member from the Paw Kamisak, Thompson and Flintflon will also attest to the fact that emergency firefighters from our communities are called upon on a regular basis. But whether or not they, they get categorized as a, uh, a full-time employee or whether they meet the threshold to be able to qualify for a potential workers' compensation claim, I would just like to see that clarified so that, in fact, that does cover that. Because they do so much more than that. Uh, I myself, back in my significantly younger days, I will say, was also uh, an EFF emergency firefighter. It was almost a, a rite of passage for us in our communities to be able to take that on. At the time, having to work 16 to 18 hours a day just to try and make $100 worth of pay. So you put in your 10 days and you're lucky if you got $1,000. But at the same time, that work was very demanding. So there was a number of different things, and I know this, this speech of legislation refers to, to, to cancers and toxins and things like that, but there's also a number of other issues that emergency firefighters and fire rangers and initial attack crews are subject to. Uh, for example, I don't think anybody in here can really imagine walking over a burning rock in plus 45 degrees while the sun's beating down while there's a fire raging behind you. So that temperature gets to be a lot hard, hotter than that. So what's, what's the long-lasting and long-term effects of that? And does that fit into this piece of legislation? So when the, the ministers spoke about there not being any kind of retroactive function to this, that is quite concerning. Because we're talking about this today, we're talking about this being an issue and a priority today, but it was also an issue and a priority yesterday. So I do ask the minister if he would consider also incorporate that and having a window of time going back into a retroactive phase to be able to do that. Because there, there is going to be, when this legislation comes forward and comes into effect, if it does come into effect, there will be other firefighters that come out and say, what about me? What about something that happened to me? I put in my 20, 25, 30 years into the civil service, into this government to protect this communities, entire communities from wildfire, but where's my appreciation now that I'm sick in the hospital? So there should be some kind of retroactive component to this piece of legislation also, and I'm hoping the minister is open to that in some kind of amendment phase. Because those firefighters need to, need to see our appreciation. So the definition of wildfire firefighters needs to be clarified, and I did ask the question, and the minister said he would undertake being able to provide that list, so I look forward to seeing that list to see that in fact it is all inclusive. Because firefighters do so much more than just actually fight fires. We're going to be, and I know for a fact, in the next little while here, we're going to be counting on those same firefighters to be sandbagging in our communities, to be sandbagging around Manitoba, because they've been called to do a number of different things. As the minister alluded to, sometimes this, this occupation starts already potentially in April, potentially in May. We're not really talking about fire, a prime fire season in, the, in those months but they are at work, so there is exposures for them in that work. So we do need to be able to compensate and, and make this all inclusive to everything that would be affected in that way. So, Mr. Mr. Oh, Madam Speaker, I, I just, for, for my few moments on the record, I did want to ask clarification and show our appreciation 
for those firefighters because they do so much more. So let's make this piece of legislation actually all inclusive and let's really define exactly what this means and that you don't have a firefighter trying to go to the workers' compensation or come to the government and say, well, what about me and have to exhaust all their, their resources and their expenses just to be treated fairly. So we ask that that is in fact covered here and it is important that this piece of legislation encompasses all that we do because we have to really show appreciation. We've had a number of different fire seasons over the last number of years where we've counted on these individuals to be able to do that and protect our communities and be able to get out there and say this is what, because who do you look to? Who do you look to when this fire situation happens? You look to the individuals that are in the wildfire fire service and they protected Northern Manitobans for generations. I talked about my, my own experience being able to do that as a emergency firefighter, but my father was also an initial attack firefighter. So they, they were exposed to all kinds of dangers and all kinds of toxins, if you will, more than just what's exposed on the job site out on a forest fire. There's a number of different avenues that come in there too, because we also see them, like I said, sandbagging. They're also at the landfills in, in rural areas of Manitoba too. So there is various exposures that they're exposed to. So we should make this uh, an effective system where they can apply for easily, not make it more difficult. And I understand this piece of legislation is the start, but it is not all inclusive and I would like to see it actually incorporate and include all of the fire service, whether it be initial attack, whether it be fire rangers, whether it be district fire rangers, whether it be EFFs, or fact of the matter, whether that be somebody who's sitting in the conservation <laughs> district office, because they still have those exposures as well. So let's make this incorporate of all of the employees and all of the staff. And that also in itself goes a long way into recruitment and retention, to know that this government has your back when I go out to work. This government has the health and safety at front of mind when I go out to work. So that's the priority that, that we have, and that's the priority that all Manitobans should have, and both sides of this chamber should be able to come to an agreement, and I think we do, on exactly what this legislation is meant to do, but let's ensure that it encompasses everybody and it's all inclusive of all our firefighters, no matter where they are in the service. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Is there any further debate on this motion? If not, is the House ready for the question? The question before the House is second reading of Bill Number 25, the Workers' Compensation Amendment Act, Wildfire Firefighters. Is it the pleasure of the House to adopt the motion? Agreed? Agreed and so ordered. The Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, Madam Speaker, can you canvass members to see if it's the will of the House to call at 5 p.m.? Is it the will of the House to call at 5 p.m.? Agreed and so ordered. The hour being 5 p.m. This House is adjourned and stands adjourned until 10 a.m. tomorrow. <laughs>